good afternoon to all of you. It's my pleasure to invite two speakers for today's first session. The afternoon's first session. Don Khan is, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. If I'm not, I'm so sorry. Is the Director of Community Relations for the Sandstone Center for Neurofeedback in the Woodlands, Texas, USA. She was a client at Sandstone Law before she became an employee. Dawn has a BA and MBA in Business Administration from the Thorlong University and is about to take the exam for her Neurofeedback Technician Certification through the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. Dawn has two sons with mental health disorders, one with autism. As a result, she has also been a dedicated mental health advocate for over two years. That's our first speaker. Our second speaker is Agnes C. Kaufman. She's the clinical director at the Sandstone Center for Neurofeedback in the Williams, Texas, USA. She is a 1991 graduate of National College of Chiropractic in Mumbai. Her postgraduate work and specialties in acupuncture. She received her diploma degree from the International Academy of Medical Acupuncture in December 2011. Dr. Agnes became interested in brain health after she lost her mother to Alzheimer's disease. In 2018, Dr. Agnes received her board certification in neurofeedback at the clinician level from the biofeedback certification international level. Hi everybody, thank you so much for having us. We are so excited to be here in beautiful Dubai. This is Dr. Agnes and I'm Dawn. Uh, as she mentioned in our opening bios, you know, we're here because we both have skin in the game. Uh, Dr. Agnes Salam had Alzheimer's disease and both of my kids suffer with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and I have one with autism. Why are we here together? I think we're the only two speakers that are speaking together at the conference. We're doing that because the topic we're going to delve into today, neurofeedback, can be kind of complicated, and so we are uh, dividing and conquering. So the doctor knows all the big words and the scientific stuff, and I'm the mom, so she speaks doctor and I speak mom. So for the parents in the room, we'll be able to explain it a little bit. We understand, and for the clinicians in the room, we'll be able to take it to a higher level, certainly. Uh, our goal of the presentation today is to answer the question that you see on the screen. Do you know what you don't know about brain health? Certainly, we wouldn't be at this conference if we didn't have some level of base knowledge. We're hoping that we're able to take that knowledge sort of up a notch today. So that's really what we're hoping to do. We're going to do that by looking at four key areas. We're going to start off talking about where it kind of all begins for us in our clinic, which is with the brain map, or the QEEG, and Dr. Agnes, that stands for I told you she knew all the big words. Uh, but we call it the brain map because that's a whole lot easier to say. But we're going to talk about the brain map, how it works, what kind of information it gives us, and how that starts the process for us in determining whether or not the client is a good fit for neurofeedback. Then, of course, we're going to talk about neurofeedback therapy. We are the neurofeedback center. We're going to talk about how it works exactly, what the benefits are. Uh, we're also going to take a look at some other brain-based therapies that we use to supplement our neurofeedback in our clinic um, that are kind of cutting edge. We think you'd be interested in hearing those. And then, even though time is short, we're going to attempt to put all of that together and look at a case study of an actual client that's been through our program. So that's sort of our roadmap for today. And starting off talking about the brain map, this is really where we determine whether or not neurofeedback is a good fit. It's the baseline for us. It's, it's all about learning how the brain is firing, how it's firing, and why. When we talk about the brain map, you know, our brains, we all know, so complex, right? We've got 86 billion with the B neurons in our brain, and every one of those neurons has over 10,000 connections to other neurons. That's a lot of complex circuitry. And those brain waves can become dysregulated just like any other part of your body can become dysregulated, right? Our, our thyroid can be dysregulated, our blood pressure can be dysregulated, our blood sugar levels can be dysregulated. And our brain waves are certainly no different. When those brain waves become dysregulated, we experience those symptoms of mental health, like you see on the board. We experience the, the anxiousness, the sadness, the impulsivity, 
the lack of focus, the lack of concentration, those racing thoughts, you can't turn your brain off, insomnia, depression, those types of symptoms. Now, obviously, those are normal human emotions, right? We all experience them. The problem is when we have dysregulated brain waves, we experience those emotions much more intensely. And they often take over our lives, take over our quality of life. We always kind of use this example in our training, so I'll share it with you. It's kind of like if this is the median range, okay? This is sort of the range that we want our brain waves to ebb and flow. So this is where somebody your age, this is the, 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 the permanent processing zone is what we call it. This is where we want our brain waves to fire. They do it by age because obviously a five-year-old's brain is not going to fire the same way as a 53-year-old's brain, right? So if your brain is firing in a regulated, balanced pattern in this median range, then you are cognitively at your best. Your moods are stable. You're sleeping great at night. But if your brain's firing outside this median range, right, we're doing a little bit of this, that's when we're experiencing these symptoms much more intensely. And that's when it becomes sort of a quality of life issue. Great example. Who loves to go to the dentist? Right, nobody, right? You like to go to the dentist? No, yeah, nobody likes to go to the dentist, right? They go to the dentist. And so when I get ready to go to the dentist, I had a bad experience as a kid at the dentist, so I get a little bit of anxiety. But you know, I get like those little butterflies, and I don't want to go, but I still go, right? I mean, I still get up and go. If I'm experiencing dysregulation in the part of my brain that handles fear and anxiety, if I'm doing this, right, I might get so fearful and so anxious going to the dentist that I would have a hard time getting out of bed. I might even call and cancel that appointment. So it really is a, a, a quality of life issue with the ability to manage those emotions. So again, this is the goal. We'll use this sort of hand signal throughout the presentation. That's the goal we're looking for. So the brain map is how we identify what areas of your brain are doing this, right? We use a company called BrainCore for our mapping software. It was developed by Richard Suter, who is one of the pioneers of neurofeedback. It's a 19-channel brain map system, and basically that means it looks at 19 different areas of the brain, front to back, side to side, it covers your entire brain. Um, we're looking at various um, qualities of the brain waves. We're looking at the magnitude of the brain waves, which is the size. We're looking at the frequency of the brain wave, which of course is the speed. We're looking at the asymmetry of the brain wave, which is how the brain waves are oriented in relation to the left and the right side of the brain. And we're also looking at the interconnectivity of the brain waves, which is the way that the two halves of the brain, the right and the left, exchange information. So that's really what we're focusing on as far as identifying the areas of dysregulation, where we're not in that perfect processing zone. It also helps us define the root causes of symptoms. I know when I was a parent going through with my kids at Sandstone, that's how I met Dr. Agnes about four and a half years ago, I was so shocked to learn the root causes of some of my kids' behaviors. Um, I learned what they could control and what they couldn't control. And that was fascinating to me. It was so helpful for me to know how to better communicate. So it helps us define the root causes. We have a better understanding of why things are happening the way that they are. And that answers some um, unanswered questions. Certainly as a parent, it absolutely does. When we do the actual brain map, the process itself, now we don't like this picture very much. It's kind of a cold picture. In our clinic, we have our, our clients sit in like a comfy recliner. We dim the lights. We've got like pretty waterfalls on the TV. But this picture at least gives you an idea of the equipment that's used. It's really relatively simple. Client comes in, puts on a cap that looks a lot like a swim cap. You see lots of little white holes. That's where we put 
baseball or soccer, whatever it is, you know that to get 10 minutes of play time, it may actually take about 30 minutes, right? And so it's kind of the same concept. If you're squirting in the chair, if you're clenching your jaw, blinking excessively, it's going to stop recording. But 10 minutes, eyes open, 10 minutes, eyes closed is what we're, what we're shooting for. Once we get that data, they compare more brain waves and the way your brain is firing to a database of other people your age. That database begins at five years old. So as a result, we can map ages five and up with the brain map. We always joke in our office, we say we, we, we map from ages five to 105. Because you can come in any day of the week and see a six-year-old with autism sitting next to an 80-year-old who's in our clinic for age-related cognitive decline. So we really do treat all ages, ages five and up. When we're looking at the brain map, the brain map really talks about four different frequencies of brain waves, and we're going to let Dr. Adams go into some detail about that. So our software measures these four classes of brain waves. Our delta waves are actually the slowest of those waveforms. They usually resonate at about one to four hertz. They're associated with deep sleep. Then we have our theta waves. That's four to eight hertz. That's associated with me and that you know, you're not fully asleep, but you're not fully awake. You're kind of that half awake, half asleep state. If you're visualizing a Tahiti vacation, if you're daydreaming, um, your theta waves are dominant. It's also the dominant waveform when you're in your rapid eye movement sleep. Then we go into the alpha waves. Their frequency is 8 to 12 hertz, and they're associated with being awake but you're relaxed. Your mind is just kind of idle. You're not really thinking about anything. Then we have our theta waves. They're the fastest waveform that our system measures, and they resonate at about 15 to 30 hertz. The beta waves are our cognitive wave. So it's when you're flexing your mental muscles. So if you're thinking about something, you're reading, you're adding numbers, that's beta. There's also another frequency of brain waves. They're called the gamma waves. Our system doesn't measure that. Most um, software systems that I've seen out there do not measure it. And that waveform is 30 plus hertz, and it's associated with higher levels of consciousness and alertness. In addition to the brain map, when we are assessing is somebody going to be a good fit for our neurofeedback therapy, we also do a functional neurological evaluation. We have some different questionnaires that we have the patient rate their um, physical symptoms and their mental systems. And it's really important when we consult with patients that we want to know what their goal of therapy is. Um, I had a mom one time and she said that her goal of therapy was to have her child not have autism. If neurofeedback can do that, could do that, right? We wouldn't all be here today because nobody would have autism. Um, so it's just making sure that there's a, you know, a realistic expectation of what what there is. Thank you, Dr. Ames. Um, we're going to look a little bit about the history of neurofeedback. Now, honestly, everybody would fall asleep. We just all had lunch. We went through the entire history of neurofeedback. It'd probably be a two-day conference all by itself. So we'll kind of give you the highlights. We'll spare you uh, right after lunch. But um, it was pioneered by neuroscientists. It's been around about 50 years, and there were a lot of scientists and medical doctors involved. Um, and there have been clinically proven results for over 50 years. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the, the case studies and the peer reviews that are out there. But it really started taking off in the 1990s with all the advances of, you know, with computer and software technology. And I think just about everything really took off in the 1990s with that. Um, so it, its foundation, though, is really in, in basic and applied neuroscience as well as, you know, database clinical practice. So a lot of people, um, how many of you are familiar with neuroscience? Okay, so a little less than half. All right, so we feel like in the States, the reason it's not as well known and it's not the go-to for doctors like you think it should be is because in the States, it's not covered by insurance. And so that's typically one of the barriers that we uh, encounter, and we feel like that's why it's not the immediate go-to, even though it's a, a, a certainly a, a proven, uh, proven method. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, I will say that since the pandemic, there has been a real push to cover like 
digital therapeutics, software-driven therapeutics. Uh, and so we're hoping, we're seeing that at the federal level in the state, so we're hoping that that opens up some doors as far as insurance goes. But we feel like that's, that's the, main, um, the main barrier to why it's not more popular than it is. Uh, but it has been around a very long time. Um, we wrote up here, if you're taking notes, write down www.isnr.org. This is the, uh, it's a website, it's the International Society for Neuroregulation Regulation and Research. This is kind of like the, the, the mothership of all information neurofeedback-wise. So if you're looking for the data, looking for providers near you, looking for the history of neurofeedback, looking for videos about neurofeedback, all of that can be found at this site. We give it to just about every client that walks through our door. One of the reasons that we like it the most is because it has the most comprehensive bibliography of research. So the case studies, the peer reviews, the efficacy rates, and they do it alphabetically by condition. So if you're a clinician and you've got a client who's suffering from um, you know, anxiety or PTSD, you can go and look it up alphabetically, very easy to find, and then you're able to find the references that you can go look up the case study. So it's the most comprehensive place for the data. I know you like to geek out on the data, and so I sense there are probably a few in the room who would like to do that as well. Uh, but there's a lot more information on the site. So go there if you're looking for some more on the history. As far as the benefits of neurofeedback goes, so really the, the goal of neurofeedback is if your brain is firing like this, we want to get it back in that perfect processing zone. So we're retraining the brain waves to fire in a regulated pattern. That's the overall goal, is to regulate those dysregulated brain waves. But, neuro, but neurofeedback also provides a medication-free solution. So there's no medication involved, there's no pain involved, it's completely non-invasive. Um, that doesn't mean that we're anti-medication, it just means that the therapy itself, there's no medication involved. So that's a plus for a lot of our clients. Um, we have seen many of our clients that do neurofeedback that are then able to either lower their dose of medication, some come completely off their medication, some are able to lower the potency of their medication, I know when my two boys went through neurofeedback four years ago, they were on four different medications between the two of them, and by the time we were done, they were on zero and still not on any of those medications. So it varies. We're not anti-med. We work with the doctors, but there's no medication involved in the neurofeedback therapy itself. And certainly it improves quality of life. Who said that? Say that past ten times. What you can't do it. Improves quality of life. That's really what it's all about. We're going to show you that through one of our case studies. All right, when we talk about exactly sort of the equipment that's involved in neurofeedback, again, this picture is a little cold, but it shows you how simple it is. It really is very simple. Now, in our office, they're sitting in a recliner, not a chair. They're looking at a television, not a computer screen. We let them sit more than seven millimeters from the screen. Um, for our kiddos, we have weighted blankets. But basically, we're putting two sensors on the head, and these sensors are small, guys. They're about the size of your fingernail. Where we place them on the head is dependent on what Dr. Agnes sees on the brain map as far as where are you dysregulated. Are you dysregulated in the front of the brain, the back of the brain, et cetera. So two sensors. Also wearing headphones. And you pick a Netflix show. You pick a television show. Now that's not a joke. You really pick a TV show. You sit back and watch the show, but your brain is working very, very hard. And so here's how it works. It's a form of operant conditioning. While you're watching the television, real time next to you there's a computer. You can see it on the screen. There's a computer and the computer is watching how your brain is firing. Are we firing in that perfect processing zone or are we firing out of that processing zone? Every time you fire in this perfect <coughs> processing zone, the screen stays bright and the volume stays loud in your ear. However, every time your brain fires in a dysregulated way or sort of the wrong way outside of that perfect processing zone, the screen gets darker and the volume gets softer. Now your brain doesn't like that. Why not? Any guesses? Why doesn't your brain like that? Because it craves stimulation. Because it craves stimulation. That's right. Because it craves stimulation. Brain needs three things to survive: oxygen, nutrients, and stimulation. We all crave stimulation, and especially our kiddos. That's why they're all addicted to video games and their iPhones, right? Your brain craves that. So the brain wants the television to stay bright and the volume to stay loud. So what happens over time, typically in our office, it's about 60 to 80 sessions, is the brain learns, hey, the only way I'm getting that brighter screen and louder volume is when I fire this way. So the brain, through its neuroplasticity, starts firing this way more and more and more. And we all know with our brains, the more our brain does something, if it does it over and over and over again, then it actually forms a new neural pathway and fires that way from then on. So neurofeedback is a permanent change. Now, there is an exception to that. Certainly if you were involved, let's say, in a, a, a car accident, you have a traumatic brain injury, you have a stroke,
through some horrific emotional trauma. That's going to change your brain. But if life goes on as it always has without any of those really impactful traumas, it is a permanent change. Um, let me give you an example of that. My son that I mentioned is on the spectrum. His name is Alex. He owns my entire part. He is uh, Angela. But he is 16 years old. So when we did this, he was about 12. And I had pulled Alex from school two years prior to stumbling into the neurofeedback center. And the reason I pulled him from school is because he was so riddled with social anxiety that I would get a call once or twice a week that he was in the fetal position in the corner, bawling his eyes out, could not handle being in a classroom with 20 other kids. So I would go get him once or twice a week, and eventually I just pulled him from school and started homeschooling. We did neurofeedback. It reduces anxiety by like, I don't know if it's a number, but like 80 gabillion percent. So much so that now Alex is back in school, absolutely thriving, and I have to tell you, and not grab his nose, he's a pretty social kid. He's the one starting the conversations in the classroom. And I attribute that quality of life, you know, um, changed the course direction of his life to the neurofeedback that we did. So, it is a form of operant conditioning, and just to kind of summarize what we mean by that, I use this example for people, and since a lot of you have not heard of neurofeedback, I'll, I'll use it here. This is for my moms in the room. I think of the way neurofeedback works like training a dog to sit. When you're training a dog to sit, you give it a what? A treat, right? So dog sits, it gets a treat. Dog sits, it gets a treat. Dog doesn't sit, dog doesn't get a treat, right? But what happens over time is, the dog learns that we keep the treats in the pantry. So every time you walk up to the pantry, what happens? Exactly, the dog runs up and sits, right? Because it's trained to do so. Neurofeedback is just like that. For your brain, the treat is the bright light and the louder bottle. Brain wants the treat, so the brain retrains and starts firing the right way in order to get that treat. Okay, we wanted to show you, I'm gonna show you a quick example here of an actual neurofeedback session in our office. I'm going to set it up for just a minute, though. Um, first of all, I apologize for the quality of the video. I shot it on my iPhone because I didn't want to bring in a big fancy camera and bright lights when a client was doing a session. But here's what you're looking for, okay? You've got to look really, really close. It's very subtle. I want you to look for the screen getting brighter and darker, right? That's brighter if I'm firing here, darker if I'm firing here. Now, you can't hear what's going on in the headphones, but the volume is adjusting at the same time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start it. It's one of our favorite clients, a veteran with PTSD. You can see he's in his recliner, he's got his headphones on, sensors are placed. You see the screen, you very subtly see it lighter and darker. Now for him, he's just watching a show, but the brain is working very, very hard. So a little bit brighter, there it just went bright, then it went dark. And if you look now, you can see this is the computer equipment that's alongside of him. It's tracking all kinds of metrics. You can see the two blue dots. Those are where the sensors are placed in the frontal part of his brain. You can see the brain waves squiggling on top. So all of this is happening in real time. As his brain is firing, it's being rewarded or not rewarded. All in real time. He's one of our very favorite clients. Yes. yes. All right. So I mentioned that's kind of how neurofeedback works in a nutshell. But we do offer some other brain-based therapies in our practice that help enhance that neural feedback, sort of make it work more good, or if you will, make it work better. And Dr. Agnes is gonna go over those very next steps.
So what that does is breathing in less oxygen, you get less oxygen delivery to your tissues. So you make the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues very low. We keep them in that low oxygen state for about three to five minutes. And then what we do is we put them in the hyperoxic state. So we increase the saturation of oxygen up to 94%. When you do that, you super saturate the blood. The hemoglobin molecules in our blood that carry the oxygen get very saturated. Now you have a very high partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. You have a very low partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues, so you push a lot more oxygen into those tissues than if you were breathing 100% oxygen the entire time. They're doing a lot of studies on this type of oxygen training. There was a really cool one that came out of Austria um, a couple of months ago, and they uh, were using measuring cognitive scores, and they found that it improved cognition 17%. The whole body vibration part of the therapy, whole body vibration has a couple of different um, benefits to it. One is it helps us with our neuroplasticity. We have specialized nerve cells outside of our joints. They call, they're called mechanoreceptors. And what they do is they tell our brain what position our joint is in. Our brain needs to know that. If my arm is bent and I want to straighten it, the brain has to know it's been so it knows what muscles to activate to straighten the arm. So when you're on that vibration plate, the mechanoreceptors outside your ankle are very active. Ooh, the foot's plantar flex, it's dorsiflex, it's inverted, it's everted. All that information travels from those nerve cells to the nerve in your leg, to your spinal cord, to your brain, to the tune of about 275 miles an hour. That's a lot of stimulation to the brain. And when the brain is stimulating a lot of new neural pathways like that, it makes it easier to get out of the pattern it's in and into a more healthy, balanced pattern. The other benefit of the whole body vibration is that it helps decrease the firing of your limbic system. They've done a lot of studies on shaking. I don't know about your dog, but my dog hates the fireworks. If the fireworks go off, my dog is like she's vibrating. Um, and if you have ever seen someone in the midst of a panic attack, what's happening? They're trembling. I'm going to be a little honest. Public speaking is not my favorite thing, and my knees are shaking a little bit right now. <laughs> so that shaking is decreasing the firing of my limbic system and making me feel calmer. The oxygen therapy, you know, the benefits of getting more oxygen to your tissues, uh, the mitochondria, right, hallucinate back to your biology class, right? The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It produces the cellular energy. The mitochondria loves oxygen. So sometimes when a brain um, is a little bit melt, ugh, you got a piece of dark. One of each, one of each, one of each, one of each, one Okay, so when it is getting metabolically depleted, the mitochondria are not function as well, and that oxygen helps that mitochondria function more efficiently. Another therapy that we have in our office is pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, or PEMF for short. It has several benefits as well. The Food and Drug Administration in our country in 2015 approved the use of pulsed electromagnetic fields for the treatment of depression. But it has other benefits as well. It too supports the mitochondria and helps the mitochondria function better. It decreases inflammation. It improves circulation to the brain. Better circulation, better nutrients, better healing. A couple other therapies we do, photobiomodulation therapy. That's a little bit of a mouthful, right? So what it is, it's a near-infrared light therapy. It's um, 810 nanometers, and we have two different photobiomodulation units. Well, it's one unit, but it operates at two different frequencies. You can use the alpha frequency, or you can use the gamma frequency. In the picture, you see there's it's the picture on the left, and so you see the headset that they're wearing. Um, there are some diodes on there that emit that near infrared light. And where the diodes sit, it's a part of your brain that's called the default mode network. So the default mode network
framework is actually a series of connections in our brain that help create our internal dialogue. So sometimes what happens with certain conditions, um, they've seen it with autism, they've seen it with anxiety, it's shown with ADHD. What happens is that default mode network is overactive. So sorry, I can't focus out here because I'm already over-focusing in here. I'm over-stimulated. In fact, your outside stimuli can be a little bit uncomfortable to me because I'm getting too much from the inside out. So for someone like that, using the photobiomodulation alpha unit, remember the alpha wave? Hey, I'm awake, but I'm relaxed, I'm idle. It helps the person turn their brain off. The gamma frequency is used to help with cognition. Both units, both frequencies also are anti-inflammatory. Heart rate variability training is just teaching someone the benefits of slow, steady, deep breathing. <laughs> Whenever somebody is in a more anxious state or their brain is producing too many of those excitatory neurotransmitters, their heart rate variability increases <laughs> And doing that slow, steady, deep breathing helps decrease it and get the brain in a more calm state. So what we're going to do next, we're going to go through a case study, and Dawn's going to get us started with that. We'll go through a case study quickly. <laughs> All right. So we're going to look at uh, Johnny. Of course, we changed the name, but an actual client of ours. Uh, Johnny came to us. Obviously, his primary issue was having emotional outbursts. He was a seven-year-old male. He had been diagnosed with autism, anxiety, ADHD. Uh, his parents talked to us about his impulsivity issues, and then again, those emotional outburst issues being a real, a real problem. In fact, you know, mom and dad were talking about just being at their wit's end. I think anyone in here that's been a parent has been there and felt that before. And it was really affecting like his siblings and his classmates at school. I mean, we know that when we have a kiddo with emotional outbursts, it doesn't just affect that kiddo. It affects the whole inner circle, the family, the friends. Um, so Johnny was really struggling. And uh, so we start off with the brain map like we always do. And Dr. Agnes is going to go over the results of the initial brain map and why you thought it would be better to do that. So the brain map that we see here is not the full brain map. Time wouldn't allow us to go over every section of the brain map. But the two sections that I have here are the magnitude and then the asymmetry. So we don't mentioned earlier that that magnitude is the size of the brain wave. And we see written um, at the bottom of the brain is delta, theta, alpha, and beta. So this is where it's measured the magnitude of those brain waves in these 19 different locations in your brain. If you look at that key to the side of the brain next to green, it says, okay, that's where the brain waves are in that median zone for your age. Where we see red, they're one standard deviation above that. Where we see yellow, they're two standard deviations above that. If we go at the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, the light blue is one standard deviation lower, the dark blue is two standard deviations lower. So okay, green is good. Okay, green is good. Green is good. Um, when we look, we have like a little rainbow going on here. What does it mean? When we look and we see, okay, Johnny was diagnosed with ADHD. When they took people that were diagnosed with ADHD and they mapped their brains and they said, are there any patterns that they have in common? When you look at Johnny's brain map here and you look at the delta and theta waves at the front of the brain and the prefrontal and the frontal cortex, we're seeing some reds and yellows there. They're higher than normal. When we look at the beta waves in those same areas at the front of the brain, they're lower than normal. This is a pattern that you see a lot in people that are diagnosed with ADHD. The high delta and theta at the front of the brain affects their attention. Parents are funny sometimes because they'll say to me, Dr. Agnes, I don't think this child has a, and his mom said this to me, I don't really think he has an attention problem. He can focus on those Legos for three hours, but he can't give me 10 minutes on his homework? I said, no, actually he can't because what happens, our selective attention gets higher. So when he's doing his Legos, he's hyper-focused. 
He's in 120%. An elephant could come in the room in a pink tutu and pirouette all around Johnny. Johnny wouldn't even see it because he's in. But it's his selective attention that gets lower. Selective attention is the ability to pay attention when it's something you're not really interested in. That's what gets lower. So he's not interested in his homework, like he's interested in his Legos. The other, and you know, another question parents will ask me, well, Doc, you know, if his dream weight is so high and his daydream weight is so high, why is he so active? You know, he's, he's hyperactive. Why isn't he falling asleep? And you remember Don said our brain craves stimulation. So all that movement is to stimulate past those slow waves. Another, uh, you know, Johnny had the emotional outburst. This pattern of too much delta and theta at the front of the brain is also associated with impulsivity, right? So impulsivity can come in many forms. Sometimes it's physical impulsivity. We've had patients that bite, that pinch, that kick. Um, sometimes it's the emotional impulsivity like Johnny was having. Sometimes it's verbal impulsivity where they talk a lot or they just like to yell and make noise. And so having that high delta and theta creates the impulse. When you look at the beta waves and they're low at the front of the brain, that's what helps us decide, hey, am I gonna act on this impulse or not? When we look at our Johnny's brain here, he only has one brain wave at, in one area of the brain where it's green. So when you have a lot of blue there, what happens is if it were all green, that would be the part of the brain that would be like, ooh, kicking's not, it's not a good option here. The last time I did this, I had a bad outcome. I'm not gonna do that. When you have the blue there, person's gonna get kicked a good percentage of the time. Johnny was also diagnosed with anxiety. When you think of anxiety and you think brain mass, think of the beta waves, right? When we look at Johnny's beta waves, they're low throughout the brain. We call that globally low. And so when someone's brain has been an active brain for a while, we'll see it get blue like that. When it's a newly active brain, we usually see it get a little bit higher and we see some red. Johnny's mom told me, she's like, I don't think his brain ever turns off. You can ask him, what are you thinking? He will never say nothing. There's always something going on in there. Our brain is a pretty busy organ anyway, right? Our brain is only 2% of our body by weight. But at the end of the day, all of the oxygen that you breathe in, 20 to 30% is utilized by your brain. All of the glucose or all of the ketones that your brain burns depending on your diet, 20 to 30% is burned by the brain. That's a lot for 2% of the body. But it makes sense, right? Here it is, command central, controlling the function of everything. Now on top of that, let's think nonstop, let's worry nonstop, Let's make our brain like a web browser with 12 tabs open, and we're running all this. So metabolically, the brain gets tired, and that's when we see those beta waves get low. That's associated with some mitochondrial difficulties. When you look at the asymmetry section, this is, when we look at this part of the brain map, we're looking at those waveforms more dominant on the left, or are they more dominant on the right? Our beta waves have a natural propensity to be left side dominant. So here, the red means higher or more dominant. Blue means less dominant. So when we look at Johnny's, we see more than half of his red has shifted to the right. That's associated with getting stuck on different thoughts, different ideas, different behaviors. It can make you like things a certain way. It can make you have scary thoughts. It can make you more easily frustrated. It can make you um, have scary thoughts and be aware of everything going on around you all of the time. It can be any of those turned on brain symptoms. Then you say, well, wait a minute. You know, he's been diagnosed with autism. What does autism look like? Well, just like a lot of the other speakers have mentioned today, I could have 10 patients come in with autism, and because the spectrum is so broad, their symptomatology is so different, we don't really have a pattern for autism. So, so if we were going to talk to 
through some of the stats, but we've heard them so many times today, I think for the sake of time, we'll just kind of rush through the stats. But the most important thing that we wanted to mention is that, you know, 78% of children with autism have some other mental health condition, and ADHD being the most common. One in four kiddos with autism also has ADHD, so that's the most common comorbidity. And so we're going to go through the, uh, the care plan that you made in one. So, usually when I do a neurofeedback plan from somebody for a patient, I usually like them to do about 60 to 80 sessions of neurofeedback because we want to create that permanency. So the first 15 sessions, I did the oxygen therapy and the whole body vibration with Johnny, the oxygen for that global low beta, the whole body vibration to help with calming, the photobiomodulation to help turn the brain off. I do use supplements sometimes, um, some different nutrients to help the brain carry out that healing and repair process. So every 15 sessions, I like to do another brain map. So when we remap Johnny's brain, he had a 51% total change. If you look at the bottom of the screen, we also have a reorganization meter and a normalization meter. Reorganization, the way our brain heals, the analogy I use for patients, it's like a Rubik's Cube. If you're solving the Rubik's Cube and you have the blue side perfect and the yellow side is perfect, but the other four sides are not perfect, do blue and yellow stay perfect the whole time? No, you have to undo those to allow the white or the red side to become more normal. So when someone first starts doing their feedback, it is pretty typical to see 60 to 70% um, reorganization and only 30 to 40% normalization. The four areas above represent the area of the brain that made the most moves towards normal. I always love to see some changes in that somatosensory cortex, that's C4 on the map. Um, Johnny was having a lot of sound sensitivity in between the normalization at the T3 area, which is that receptive language area in the somatosensory, he could tolerate sound better. He was able to go to the movies where before he was like this. So. We also heard from Johnny's mom that you know, the relationships got better both at school with his classmates, at home with his siblings. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of positive results that extended beyond just Johnny as well. And we might mention too that in Johnny's case, and, and actually most of our clients, about 85% of our clients will do those first 15 sessions that Dr. Agnes mentioned with those additional therapies because those happen in our office. But then they'll take the home unit. So this is all, neurofeedback itself is completely portable. You can do it on your laptop. We give you the sensors, we give you the, the gel. So we have people you know, that are far away and do it on your own, but you're not because it records every right. session. Thank you. 
It's really nice to be here, and we're going to have Dr. Temple with us live right now. Dr. Temple does not need an introduction. Can you tell I'm one of the biggest fans here? But Dr. Richard will introduce her. No, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. Um, Dr. Grandin is an American academician, behavioral animal behaviorist and internationally renowned spokesperson for autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Grandin is one of the first autistic people to demonstrate the insights that she has gained from her personal experience of autism. She is currently a faculty member with Animal Sciences in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University. Based on her experience, Grandin advocates early intervention to address autism and support teachers and professionals who can redirect children and adults with, um, in fruitful decisions and directions. She has been an outspoken proponent of animal rights and the neurodiversity movements. In 2010, Temple Grandin was listed as one of the 10 most influential people in the world by Time 100, which named her in the heroes category. In 2011, she received a double helix medal and has received many honorary degrees from many universities, including McGill, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Carnegie Mellon, etc. Grandin has been featured on many media programs. She was the subject of an Emmy and Golden Globe winning biographical film, Temple Grandin. In 2018, Grandin was featured in the documentary, This Business of Autism, which explored autism employment and the success of autism employers. She has been written up in Time, People Magazine, Discover, Forbes, and the New York Times. She is best known for designing the Hug Machine, which is a deep pressure gadget planned to calm extremely sensitive people, which are ordinary people with autism, and I know her personally, working with her as a colleague to sequence her entire genome, to read the chromosomes from end to end and make sense of that as to how they caused her condition 
and how they continue to influence her life. And I'll never forget the working with her to do that. And if you're interested in what we found out, um, come to my lecture tomorrow at 11 something. So I'm um, introduced, I'm um, Dr. Grandin. Well, it's good. And also a lot of emphasis on skills, like getting dressed, combing your hair, brushing your teeth, um, eating with utensils. Well, if you, one little tip with these kids, you have to give them time to respond. They're like a phone that's only got one bar of service. And slow down when you talk to them. And when the grown-ups talked fast, it went to gibberish. Can you put the next slide up, please? Now, the thing about autism is it goes all the way from Einstein, who had no speech until age three, to somebody who has much more severe um, uh, on autism when they become nonverbal, but some of the ones that are nonverbal can learn to type independently. But a brain can be more social emotional, or a brain can be more interested in what they do. And having an interesting career has been very important to me. I'm I'm really happy that I'm a professor. I've got graduate students and I've uh, done a lot of research in animal behavior. I have three graduate students that have become university professors. I'm very, very happy about that. So a brain can be more social, emotional, or a brain can be more interested sort of in what they do. This is why I think it's important to get kids out doing interesting things. Um, some of these kids that get addicted to video games, um, one of the ways to get them off the video games is have them fix motorcycles, have them fix cars. It's the one thing that's worked. They find out that maybe fixing those motorcycles is much more interesting than the video games. And that's something that can turn into a career. And it's a skill that other people want. Let's go to the next slide. Shows a picture of Thomas Edison. He would probably be autistic today. He dropped out of school. Now, fortunately, he had a mentor. And he had um, a mentor that taught him how to use the telegraph. It's really important for students to get exposed to things. I didn't originally, I was not originally in the cattle industry. I got exposed to it as a teenager. And I had very good teachers and mentors starting with my mother when I was very young. She was always pushing me to do new things. She encouraged my ability in art. Um, I had a wonderful uh, primary school teacher. I had a wonderful science teacher who got me interested in studying with all kinds of interesting projects to do. Uh, good teachers are so important. Let's go to the next slide. There's Einstein. He would probably be in an autism program today. Let's go to the next slide. Put the next slide up, please. Now, I'm a kind of a NASA fan. And I, I got five years ago, I got a chance to go visit, uh, Cape, uh, visit this launch pad. Uh, this was like so much fun. And what I learned when I went there is the astronauts, uh, they may have, they had the, we call it the right stuff, but they were people that had Tourette syndrome, that were dyslexia. They were building the launch pad. They were um, uh, designing control rooms. There were people there at NASA, really smart people, that were, you know, some of them probably were on the autism spectrum. I've been to many, many NASA sites. And if you look at the old um, videos of going to the moon, look at the people in that control room. I think there was quite a few autistic people there. And they were really happy that they got to be involved in that project. Let's go to the next slide. Now I've got emotions, but I get emotional over interesting stuff I do. And um, Voyager spacecraft now is 45 years old. The scientists are in their 80s now. They are still tracking it. They've managed to keep it going. For a long time, they had to work out of a storefront next to a McDonald's, but they kept it operating with no funds. And I can get really into that because it's so cool what they're doing. They're still learning from this spacecraft that's 45 years old. Let's go to the next slide. Now past Saturn, we can go to the next slide. And then you've got the um, you've got the techies down there that keep that antenna going. Yeah, they probably have to do it at three o'clock in the morning. I got a chance to sit at the original um, uh, mission control um, desk. That was really, really cool. Go to the next slide. Now let's not get hung up on the labels. Autism is this big spectrum. And the problem with autism is they keep changing the diagnosis. Originally, you know, maybe you know, 30 years ago or so, you had to have speech delay to be labeled autistic. 
And then they added Asperger's syndrome, where you could be socially awkward, no speech delay. And then in 2013, they merged everything together. And you've got a spectrum that's going from Einstein to somebody that may have much more severe uh, problems. But I can't emphasize enough on working with the little kids, because when I was three, I looked very, very severe. And we can go to the next slide. I have grandparents that come up to me all the time, and they find out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. That just happens all the time. And sometimes adults later in life getting diagnosed helps them with their relationships. But I'm concerned that too many fully verbal, smart kids on the spectrum get so hung up on the label, the parents get hung up on the label, that the kid's not learning basic skills like shopping, learning how to save money, doing laundry, just very, very basic things. Another big problem I'm seeing is not making the transition into the world of work. Work skills are not the same skills as academic skills. We need to start children when they're 11 years old, maybe uh, volunteering at a fruit stand or something like that, where they learn how to work for somebody outside the family on a schedule. Go to the next slide. Now that's uh, me uh, having a real fun time at the vehicle assembly building. We'll show another slide. All the cool stuff I got to go do there, like go up on the roof and I wasn't supposed to. That was really cool. All right, let's just get back to the uh, getting important stuff in autism. Let's talk about some basic issues here. Sudden surprises scare. Okay, let's say a child's going to go to a new school. We'll try to visit it maybe before they go there or look at the website. Um, the other thing... Um, it's difficult for a lot of individuals with autism is multitasking when you rapidly have to multitask. But we've got to get these kids out doing stuff. We've just got to do that. And I was brought up in the 50s and we used a method I call it teachable moments. So let's say I took my drink right here and I stirred it with my finger. That's not that's bad table manners. Now my mother, instead of saying no, she would say, use the spoon. People think it's disgusting when you put your finger in the cup. She would give the instruction instead of saying no. That was a, my generation, a method of teaching social skills. And social skills were taught in a much more structured manner than they are today. We need to limit the screen time, the phones and the computers to about an hour a day. And we need to get kids out doing things on um, today, I saw some kids out playing in the playground that's near my house, and that's the kind of stuff that kids should be doing. Let's go to the next slide. So there's the teacher there working with a really young kid. And the thing I have found on very young children's programs, some teachers just have the ability to work with these little kids. Now, if you've got a little kid that's not talking, the worst thing you can do is let them just sit and play with a phone all day. That's the worst thing you can do. You need to get an effective teacher working with them. And I find some teachers have the ability and some don't. Let's go to the next slide. Teaching turn-taking. That was done with me with board games. You have to learn how to wait. It's something that's very important for young autistic children to learn how to wait. And we'll go on to the next slide. Teachable moments, we already talked about that. You don't yell and say, stop it. You give the instruction and the reason why. Let's go to the next slide. We need to limit the video games. One of the things that I was not allowed to do when I was in high school was just become a recluse in my room. I was not a good student, I was a terrible student, but I still had to attend the classes. You know, too many of these kids are just getting on the electronics and just staying in their room, playing video games all day, and they're not getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry. And if they were getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry, I'd be a lot more positive about it. But some young adults, again, addicted to video games, the one thing that was successful in getting them off of it was working on motors and engines. And they found out that they were more interesting than the video games. Let's go to the next slide. Now, my mother would always stretch me to new, do new things, but she always gave me a choice. You know, we could go to this store or that store, or you could do this activity or some other activity. Always giving choices. You can do your homework when you get home from school, or you can do your homework after dinner. 
giving some choices. And one of the things that helped me uh, being raised in the 50s is um, we had sit down dinners and you know, the, my sister and my parents would take turns telling about their day. Unfortunately, in some families, um, that's not happening. And this was part of um, part of uh, getting me to be a lot more social. And and you can learn business social. Another thing that was done in my family is when we were seven or eight years old, and it was done with most of the families in my generation, is when I was a little kid, I had to dress up in my good clothes when the parents had a party. And I had to serve the snacks. I had to shake hands with them, learn how to talk to them. Really, really good social training. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about sensory issues. Sensory issues are really real. And loud sounds like a school bell or hair dryer or maybe a vacuum cleaner would hurt my ears. Now, one of the ways to help a child to tolerate these sounds is to let the child play with the vacuum cleaner where they turn it on, they turn the hair dryer on. And when the child turns the dreaded noisy thing on, they often get to where they can tolerate it better because they are controlling it. Now there's some kids wearing headphones all the time. And the problem is if you wear headphones all the time, and that's on the next slide, um, the sound sensitivity may get worse. So what you want to do is have them with you. You can have them in your backpack. So they're with you. They give you the control. You've got them with you. But then you try not to wear them. because you, I've heard stories where they were wearing headphones all the time and the child got so sensitive, he couldn't tolerate quiet conversation at the dining room table. But sensory problems really are real. Um, sensory integration methods can be helpful. There's a paper you can look up online that's called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. And it's a method where you stimulate two senses at the same time, uh, maybe touch a, a warm a coffee cup and then um, uh, smell some aromatherapy. So you're stimulating two senses at the same time. And the title of the paper is Environmental Enrichment, an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, let's say we have a nonverbal older child or adult and, and problems with maybe destructive behavior or hitting. The first thing with somebody who cannot speak is give them a way to communicate. Not being able to communicate is totally frustrating. Also, you have to rule out, do they have a painful medical problem that they can't tell you about? That's the first thing you made to make sure they don't have acid reflux. I had acid reflux last night because I ate some hot sauce. I wish I hadn't eaten. And I, 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 uh, you know, my, my stomach was hurting last night. Uh, but, the, but the sensory overload, if they have a, a, you know, a meltdown or outburst in a busy, noisy store, that is probably sensory overload. But we've also got to give them a way to communicate. That is just super, super important. Um, there's a next slide just shows that sensory symptoms are part of the neurobiology of autism. Now, when I was a little kid, they tested me for two things, deafness and epilepsy. Now I could pass the deafness test, but the problem is my ability to hear auditory details impaired. Like if the grownups talk fast, it was when Adults talked fast, it's like blah, 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 blah. that's what it sounded like because I didn't hear the the hard constant sounds. Like if someone said the word cat and they said it fast, I would hear ah. So my speech teacher would say cat ta, or she'd hold up a cup and she'd say cup pa, and she switched back and forth between saying cup and cup pa. Because if people talked fast, then all I heard were the vowel sounds. Stretch out and enunciate the, um, the consonants. And, and sometimes um, I'm hearing what kind of cut in and out, like a bad mobile phone uh, connection. There's kind of three ways that the brain can have a problem with language. I'm not hearing the auditory detail, where I'm hearing gibberish. Blah, 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 blah. Trouble with getting my speech out, expressive. And then the next slide, I talk about echolalic children. And echolalic children, they have good speech, 
and they will recite an entire movie script. But the problem is they don't know what the movie script means. That's the problem. So in Life Animated, what these parents did is they this uh, child had memorized Disney movie and they um, picked out phrases in the movie that could be used in real life. And then they, their son started to figure out um, that words had meaning. So an echolalic kid, you've got to teach them that all this language they're yakking out has meaning. So there's kind of three ways the brain can be messed up. The next slide talks about attention shifting slowness. Now, if I was a computer, I've got a very, very small, um, you know, I'm an Intel 286. I mean, if you're a computer geek, uh, that's the first chip. But I have huge memory. Attention shifting slowness. This is why you have to give the child time to respond. The next slide shows tension shifting slowness. It's an old Ami Klin slide, and look at how the uh, normal person's looking at the eyes. But the other more important thing in this slide is look at how many times the normal person looked back and forth compared to the autistic person who's trying to lip read. Tension shifting slowness. All right, now let's look at things where this could cause a problem at work. I want to see these kids get employed. And I want to avoid the jobs such as rapid multitasking at a McDonald's takeout window. That would be a very bad job. Another problem is I don't have any working memory. So if um, let's say I have to like shut down the cash register at night at a store and then maybe five or six steps, I need to write them down. I need to write the steps down like a pilot's checklist. Long yakety yak. Strings of verbal information do not work with me. Let me make a pilot's checklist. Okay, and if you don't want to disclose autism, just say to your employer, pilots need a checklist. I need one too. And for pilots, it's mandatory. In every country in the world, pilots have to use checklists. Now, I'm talking about giving the child uh, time to respond. When I was five years old in school, we had a little assignment where we had to name the pictures that began with B as in beautiful. So I called the suitcase a bag and the teacher marked it wrong. And she didn't give me time to explain that in our house, they weren't suitcases, they were bags. And that was very, very frustrating for me. In the next slide, we're gonna be talking about some visual problems. I don't have visual processing problems, but some individuals do and vision might break up similar to a migraine headache. Or this next slide that shows an image that's breaking up. Uh, uh, seeing probably wouldn't be a primary sense if that's the way things look like. And this may explain why a number of people that do not speak touch and smell things because those senses provide um, uh, accurate information. And we'll go on to the next slide that shows an escalator. Now in your brain, um, you have the eyes that work like a camera, but then in the back of the brain, there's circuits that assemble the graphics file for shape, color, motion, and texture. And if there's something wrong with those circuits. Print may jiggle on the page when you try to read. These kids are often terrified of escalators because they can't tell how to get on and off of it. So you have a child that hates an escalator. The chances are it has a visual processing problem. Um, and the eye exam may be more or less normal. And if you have a child that can't read, um, the next slide shows print jiggling on the paper. Uh, try different pale colored papers. Now this is my children's project book right here. Well, um, you see the light blue paper color right there. Try printing on um, uh, the, uh, the homework and the reading materials on maybe light tan paper, light gray paper, all these different colored papers, that sometimes really works for some types of dyslexia. Just try different colored paper, try different colored backgrounds on your computer, on your laptop or on the iPad. The next slide I talk about lighting issues. And one of the big ones now is LED lights that flicker. And one of the ways that you can determine if LED lights are bad is take pictures of them in slow motion. So you want to wave like this, because when you play it back, you want to make sure it's playing back in slow motion. And you're going to find some flat screen TVs that flicker. Now, 
tablets do not flicker. Most laptops do not flicker. But there's going to be some flat screen TV mo um, computer monitors that are bad. And this does not affect all, all people with autism. But I'm going to say that 10 or 20 percent may have a problem with seeing flicker of, of LED lights or on uh, TVs and computer monitors. So what do you do if you have that problem? You go buy a lamp and you find an LED light that does not flicker and you put it next to the desk. And they, the, you can buy cheap ones that don't flicker. But this is something that's a real problem. And when I get asked about designing a uh, school or a home for people with autism, I wanna make sure we have LED lights that do not flicker. I just learned from a technical specialist that if a TV flickers, it has to do with the internet connection. Um, you know, but this, this kind of stuff um, needs to be fixed and you can just test it with slow motion video. The next slide just talks about some more severe um, sensory issues. In noisy environments, I am not able to hear because of all the background noise, cannot hear. Um, and I also cannot follow very rapid chit chat conversations where people get very social, chit chat and back and forth very rapidly. I get bored with that. Um, and there's questions coming up about masking. Um, some of that stuff's just too hard for me to do, but you can always do some business social. You know, shake hands with people. There are some individuals that need breaks, um, but sensory problems are real. Let's go on to the next slide. The next slide um, talks about this environmental enrichment program where you use inexpensive, cheap things to stimulate two senses at the same time. You're always changing the things that you stimulate and it's an adjunct or an add-on to other types of therapy. Now, the next slide shows some really wonderful books for um, um, that have been written by non-speaking um, autistics. Now, I really like um, How Can I Talk My Lips Don't Move by Tito. I had a chance to meet Tito and he came into a library and he was flapping and, and everything. And I wanted to see, um, I tested him with a really, really strange picture that he had never seen before. And it had an astronaut in a spacesuit riding a horse out in the desert. And I showed that to Tito and he types really fast, Apollo 11 on a horse. Another good book's Carly Fleischman's, uh, um, Arthur Fleischman's Carly's Voice. Then you've got The Reason I Jump, the sequel to The Reason I Jump. I like the sequel, it's a better book. But I'll give you a little tip about the typing. Remember the problem with attention shift. Okay, like on this desktop, my keyboard's way down here. But when I type, that print appears way up here on the screen here and the keyboard's down below where the video is. Now, many people with autism cannot make that attention shift. And that's the reason why you want to use a tablet because the virtual keyboard, with using that virtual keyboard, the writing appears right next to the top of the keyboard. Or you're gonna to have to, on a laptop, put the keyboard on a box and you need to make sure it's a monitor that does not flicker. This is really, really important. Next slide just shows some brain scans. And the point I want to get across right there, different parts of the brain get turned on when you do different things, like seeing things, hearing words, thinking about things. And where there's a problem in autism is in kind of the inter-office communications. And what you tend to get is uneven skills. Like I'm really good at art and mechanical stuff. Somebody else might be really good at mathematical stuff. And we'll just show some more pretty brain scans. Um, next slide shows, oh, that's my skull. Let's show the next slide. That's the microbiome. You see the little tiny hairs there. Uh, those are axon tails and they form great big uh, inter-office communication cables between different parts of the brain. And then I can show you a slide without my ugly skull. And that the connectome is much prettier when it's by itself. The next slide shows the circuit in the brain for speak what you see. Now there's a normal control right there, and I'll show you mine. Next slide. That's my speak what you see. And I have all these extra branches for visual thinking, but I have less fibers for speech. So that might explain why I had trouble getting my speech out. But when I had speech therapy, it increases the bandwidth on the fibers that are still left. And the next slide just shows that. 
And, but this is where the therapy made a difference because I had trouble getting my speech out. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if I speak what I hear, I am definitely not an auditory person. I am definitely a visual person. And we'll go on to the next slide. And I want to talk about the importance of developing strengths. That's an artwork I did when I was about six or seven years old. Mother always encouraged my ability in art. It's a picture of a wooden uh, a dock or deck that was um, by the beach. And she always encouraged my, um, my art. And the next slide just shows a picture a young child did in three-dimensional. Most little kids don't do that. And I would just draw the same horse's head over and over and over again. So mother would broaden my skill. Let's draw the stable. Let's draw the saddle. Or if you have a child that likes cars, let's read about cars, do math with cars, draw pictures of different cars. In other words, broaden that fixation. Broaden the fixation, especially if it's something like cars that can turn into a career. The next slide just talks about um, um, the art ability being encouraged. I uh, often will have uneven skills, really good at art. I was actually terrible at mathematics, but then you're gonna have another autistic person that's good at math. And we'll go to the next slide where it shows that the way I think it's videos in my head or movies in my head. I'm what's called an object visualizer. And in my new book, Visual Thinking, the hidden gifts of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. I discuss three different kinds of thinking that you can have in autism. Most people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. But in autism, you might get an extreme object visualizer. That's me. And the HBO movie shows how I think. My kind of mind's good at art, mechanical things, photography, working with animals, absolutely terrible in mathematics. And then you have the next kind of mind is the visual, spatial, mathematical mind. And the mathematical mind thinks in patterns. And then you have people that think in words. And it's important to you know, kind of know how the child thinks. That just shows eclipse shadows um, where the eclipse, um, the uh, trees ma made little tiny eclip uh, eclipses like a pinhole camera. That happened on our campus. I noticed detail. I watched a whole bunch of students just walk over that. They just didn't notice it, but I noticed visual detail. The next slide shows two things that can bother cattle, like seeing a car through the fence, seeing a piece of red string, seeing a bottle there that might move. Little things that um, people don't notice. Also in autism, there is a better, um, there's some uh, better ability to um, pitch discrimination. Um, there's been a lot of research that shows that these sensory things really, really are real. And the next slide shows one of my cattle handling facilities. And one of the, how did I sell my work? One of the things I did to sell my work was to show off pictures of things I had designed. And one thing I really liked in the HBO movie is that it showed my actual projects. It also shows how I think in pictures. It's very, very accurate on that. And I can say that the uh, geek side of me really liked that. The next slide shows um, a recreation of one of my projects in the HBO movie. I thought that was just so cool. I really, really liked that. The next slide shows uh, starting on my very first project. Now I had some good mentors in the construction industry. On my first project, the Swift plant, 1974, I criticized some welding and I said it looked like a bird had poo pooed on it. And that was pretty rude. And the plant engineer pulled me into his office in private and said, I had to apologize for that rude kind of talk. He told me what I should do. And then another person that helped me was a small contractor, steel and concrete work contractor, who had seen my drawings and seeked me out. And for 10 years, we built projects together. And so those are on a construction site, some of my early projects. And some of the most fun stuff I ever did was working in construction. And I worked with a lot of people that were probably dyslexic, ADHD, or autistic. Some of these people owned big companies where they made mechanical equipment. They had lots of patents. This I really put the emphasis on the career. This is what's made 
life uh, happy for me is having a fulfilling career. The next slides just show some of my drawings. And, and when I showed people my drawings, they were impressed. That's how I sold jobs. Okay, let's work on what are we gonna do about job interviews? Well, a job interview for me was lay the drawings on the table and show off the drawings. That's what I did. And they'd look at my drawings and go, well, in fact, actually today, now that everything's computerized drawings, I'm seeing some very bad drawings. And uh, now the next drawing shows a dipping vat system. And you can see on the concrete work, I have all the reinforcing rods drawn in there. Uh, four years ago, I got a really horrible set of drawings <laughs> that the uh, engineering firm had done on a computer and they didn't, hadn't drawn in the reinforcing rods. And I marked them all in pencil and I said, you go back to that engineering firm and, and get it done right. This is a piece of equipment I developed for the meat industry called the center track restrainer system. You can see a lot of complicated steel work there. And one of the people I worked on this was autistic, undiagnosed. Special ed department builds the stuff and we need these skills. We need to find back doors into jobs, you know, where you just kind of bypass the interview and get jobs. Well, you know, a friend that has a store and maybe they'd be willing to work with the kid. I think I'm going to stop there. You can have the rest of the slides because I'd like to do questions. And I've already talked about some of the most important stuff. But that what you see right there is high end skilled trades. And I'm. Uh, I was very interested though. I went to the Steve Jobs Theater right before COVID shut everything down. And the glass walls came from Italy and Germany and the carbon fiber roof came from Dubai. That's very, very high-end skill to trades. That's something to be proud of. All right, let's get some questions going right now. Hope I'm gonna get some questions. Hello? Hello? Yes, let's get some questions. Yeah, just a second. Hi, uh, my name is Sona. I have a son, he is nearly eight years old. And I always have this uh, question because uh, I'm a big fan of you and I know you know a lot about autism and animal behavior. So I wanted to ask, what's the connection between visual sensory preference as um, my cats and my son, they both like similar toys and uh, they have similar visual preference. Is there now, any does link? Your son, does your son speak? He is speaking, but he is not like having any big vocabulary. So he has very short vocabulary and has sensory issues. What do you have, does he have a decent way to communicate? Even something out like one of these computerized um, things don't speak or a picture board or something that we able to communicate with? No, we never use like visual uh, pictures like pecs. We never use those. So we um, encouraging him to use more spontaneous speech and uh, you know, the speech therapist, the ABA therapist, all of them, what they recommend, we follow that. Well, does it, if he can learn to speak, then you don't need to use pecs. But yeah. if you have a child that has like three word vocabulary mm -hmm. and is eight years old, we need to give him another way to communicate more easily. Mm -hmm. And that, I can remember the frustration when I, uh, when I couldn't communicate. And I remember that, uh, I showed you that picture of the bicycle in the suitcase. And it was so frustrating when the teacher didn't give me time to explain that in our house suitcases were bags. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand the concept of the letter B, the sound of the letter B. Uh, but but that, he, uh, there's a point where, where uh, they need to get, get a better way to communicate. Yeah, some he, kids can uh, sign language, some kids uh, can, uh, there's various programs you can get for tablets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is he started talking uh, just uh, before he gets six, so it's really delayed. So that's why... But is he starting to talk? Are you getting more and more language? Yes, yes, and okay. more clarity. Like it takes time, like it's a step by step, but we had 
uh, him from severe autism. Now he is in the, between low and moderate autism. Okay, so well, in the spectrum. Good. If you're getting progress, on parents yeah. always asking about different programs. I said the most important thing is you're getting progress. Yes, now, if we you're have. getting progress right now, then you're doing the right thing. Yes, the only problem I'm struggling is his memory and his sensory problems. That kind of restrict him to learn more and focus on uh, uh, tasks and academics. And he's better in maths. As you say, there are a few types of visual learners. He is more into maths and numbers l rather than alphabets and reading. Okay, well, you see, because I told, said there's a visual kind of autism. That's me. Yeah. But there's also a mathematical. There are kids that are very mathematical. He is they visual in math. maths, but he's not very visual in, uh, he's not into reading that much, but he's better in maths, like counting and numbers. He's okay. really good well, with that's numbers. Good. Then you may, maybe you can move him ahead in numbers. Uh, how is he at things like getting dressed, uh, bathing, these kinds of things? The, he is very independent. Wherever I taught him, is very independent. Good, good. That, that is. That's good, learning those skills. Yeah, he is even better than my other children, like um, tip, neurotypical ones. So he is more independent than them, and he understands routine better than them. The only problem I have, I can't find uh, his special skill. He really likes music, and he is very athletic. He does parkour, he does uh, swimming, he does Cycling. Well, good. He's, he's very athletic. That's good. And see, the problem you got with autism is it's such a wide spectrum now. Let's say you take a diagnosis like dyslexia. Okay, that's problems of reading. Mm -hmm. Or ADHD. You know, you tend to, you know, uh, detention. It's a much narrower diagnosis. And this is the problem we've got. We've probably got half of autistic kids that have a special skill, and there's going to be some that don't really have a special skill. Yeah, he has well, autism, ADHD, and dyslexia, all three, and Erlen syndrome. Well, the Erlen syndrome, um, have you tried the Erlen glasses? Yes, I, I myself, I qualified uh, as well. I just took the course so I can keep checking on him. Uh, yeah, we got the glasses. Well, the other thing I find that, that works also for people that have Erlen syndrome, I talked about the colored paper. Yeah, we do use. You, okay, so yeah, we do use all of his notebooks on. are turquoise. Well, I, like I've got a tan shirt on right now, mm -hmm. and, and that would be one of the colors, the, the light tan like this shirt. Mm -hmm. um, some people like that, and then other, other people, they like this um, light, light blue that's on my children's project book. Yeah, 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 that um, light blue, that's the thing for light, him. Light blue, calms like him. my tie. Yes, it calms him. The pale uh, colors. Yeah, yeah. Not, not dark blue, light blue. Yeah, I changed light those, but black. he still have sensory, visual sensory problems. So is and there any about, connection? Now, what about uh, a sound sensitivity? Sound sensitivity he has, but I uh, kind of um, always um, give him that opportunity. Like you said, he's in charge of hair dryer, okay. he's in charge of hand dryer, you know, when we go to cinema, yes. at the beginning he was very hesitated, but then he got used to, so now he is properly sitting like other children. So I kind of make him to be prone to that, and he's used well, to it. Well, that's good that you see, you see him in making him, see when the child turns the hair dryer on and off, or the vacuum on and off, where they control it. Yes. That to desensitize some of that. Yeah, but still I'm struggling with his memory and his visual sensory. Like, my cat and him, they prefer the same toy, you know what I mean? Like, he will kind of keep doing with that, uh, playing with that toy, even though he has thousand other toys. Uh, but and his preference... how preferred. is he taking turns at a game? He was not good. He was uh, having meltdowns, he would get angry, but I... I kind of uh, desensitized him with that as well, like on the cues cool. of airport, um, like slowly, slowly by rewarding him using ABA techniques. And, well, and, you, and, you, and you don't have a surprise at the airport, you know, like you would watch videos and, and I, I found that one of the things that I got afraid of and that made them interesting. Yeah, exactly. That uh, sports. It, what, what one parent did about the hand dryers in the bathrooms, they went to the websites of all the manufacturers of the hand dryers, 
And then they got interested in how they worked and they collected all the websites <laughs> of hand dryer manufacturers. No, seriously, this actually helped. Yeah, yeah, it's the same with him. Wherever we start with, like even food, diet, we started with him. At the beginning, he didn't like. Now he loves uh, healthy, you know, clean food. He wouldn't oh. eat rice before. He was addicted to all these carbs, rice. Oh, yeah, he's bad. Now he and wouldn't I, eat. I get worried that some of these kids with these restrictive diets are going to get the old vitamin deficiency diseases. There was a horrible case where a kid got scurvy. Which yeah. is vitamin C deficiency. Because yeah. the diet was so restricted. Maybe we need to get somebody else to ask a question. I want to give somebody else a turn. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, good morning and nice to meet you. You made a point about uh, people who don't speak much, uh, they're more on touching and smelling things. And I just wanted to know how can that be helped and how can they be, me, uh, they be helped to speak better? Well, that if, if, you want to, if you read, I really recommend that you read Tito's book, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? It is available in an electronic book. I checked Amazon recently, it is available. And he talks about vision being scrambled. Also, the Japanese boy in the sequel, which I think is a better book, he talks about being like a broken robot and having problems with controlling his movements. And if you have an older child or an adult that's either non-speaking or very poor speaking, I really recommend these books because it gives the inside view of, of their issues. And I don't have scrambled vision. I see just fine. You see, this is where autism has uh, has all, all these variations. But some of them um, have get scrambled vision, and then smell and touch actually work. Those senses are giving accurate information, so then they tend to use them since they work. So the but the wish have, the I wish. I really recommend. Um, really, really, really recommend those books. Um, the, um, I can just, I've got a power uh, PDF here. I'll just hold up that slide again of those books right there. Oh, if you have an older kid or an adult that doesn't speak, um, those, are, those books are going to give you so much insight. They type independently. Nobody's holding their wrist or their arm. They type completely independently. And they describe sensory scrambling. Now, I don't have this. I have sound sensitive. And then there's some, uh, I have a student that had the problem with uh, print jingling on the page. But you see, this is where the sensory stuff is so variable. This is sensory <coughs> problems a lot worse than mine is. Good morning. I have, my question is how to teach taking turns. There is a child, eight year old, he struggles with taking turns. He can't wait. And while well, playing... That, that was the reason why when I was three, uh, we spent a big part of my therapy was learning how to wait and take turns in games. Yeah, how do I teach? How do I do it? Like, uh, there, sometimes there's a video activity happening and there are three kids. One after another, they can watch their um, favorite clip, video clip for maybe five minutes. But he can't wait for others. Well, let's, let's do something where it's shorter than five minutes, okay. like uh, a board game. We play a lot of Parcheesi, which is a very simple board game where you shake little cups with dice in it and you move little wooden, uh, wooden uh, pieces around on the board. And, and uh, I remember grabbing that cup and the mother said, you've got to wait for your sister to take her turn. And, right. and something where the, it's not five minutes, Let's do some turn-taking thing where it's you one know, minute. Like you take a turn. Part cheesy takes ten seconds. Okay, so I start with I start with ten seconds to the first activity should be very uh, short. Well, but the the thing is, the learn, my speech teacher that I had years ago this would be like 1950. Okay. I, she just knew that teaching the kids how to take wait and take turns was super important. My therapy had a lot of emphasis on it. 
All right. Thank I'll wait in line. Okay, you're at the supermarket and you've got to wait in line. You can't cut to the front of the line. Uh, the, that's also chart taking. The child is able to wait in queue, but only taking turns when there's a uh, person who is talking to him. He finds it difficult. In queue, nobody is speaking to each other. They are facing the other way. So he finds it very easy to wait in queue. But he okay, has... Okay. But when he has to play with other children or he has to watch a video and wait for that time, he feels that he's not given his... Uh, I, he's not having control on his activity. I don't know what is the exact feeling he has. Well, he might try, he might try different things. When we were kids, we did a lot of relay races take turns running and kicking a ball or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, try some different things that involve taking turns. Now, if you're watching videos, uh, one thing I'd recommend is the phone be physically passed. All right. The phone, the phone has to be physically Phys passed. Right. passed. Thank you so and much. The taking turns means the phone has to be given to the other person and passed around if you're doing something on a phone. All right. I think that's going to help on the taking turns. Thank you so much. Okay, well, maybe we can get another question. Uh, hi, Doctor. Uh, nice to meet you today. Uh, in the last five years, uh, we're hearing uh, somebody tell like, uh, autism causes by uh, TV. I want today uh, listen uh, in uh, your opinion. Caused by what? I didn't hear you. Uh, TV, TV. Television, tele television, TV. Television. Yeah, so somebody tell that. No, no, autism is not caused by yeah. television. But if you let a uh, child spend ten hours a day watching television, that's not that's bad, and it'll probably make the autism worse. You know, we need to be getting them out and doing things. No, but television does not cause autism. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm Eleonora. I want to ask you what uh, do you think about the connection between language and motor coordination? Is it important to improve motor coordination in autistic children to improve also language? What do you think? Well, there's some really interesting things that's happening with horseback riding. And I've had parents tell me that their kid did their first words on a horse. Now, there's, two, there's three things that happen on a horse. First of all, riding horses is really fun. Yeah. But the other thing is you have to balance and there's rhythm. You're doing balancing and rhythm at the same time. Now, occupational therapists and sensory integration might get you on, on a swing and do some of the same thing. But when you stimulate the vestibular system yeah. with balance and rhythm, that can be real helpful. Another simple thing that might work is you nail a board to the floor, and then you have the person walk, what we call walk the type of yeah. like this, along the board that's nailed to the floor. I mean, it's only like that far above the floor. Um, but you do these activities that stimulate the cerebellum. Yeah. Things like swinging. Um, there's a paper I worked on years ago with Warner King, and the child, and they had him on a swing, and they were working on speech. And there's some good things with the motor and speech. And, and the thing that's not known is which kids respond to this. You see, this is the problem with any of these sensory things. You know, it works on one kid and another kid, it doesn't work. Okay, I worked on my squeeze machine. Some okay. kids respond to deep pressure, other yeah. kids don't. Um, this is where the sensory problems are, are real very. Um, but some individuals, they do swinging, balancing, rhythmic activities. Yeah. That can help on speech for some individuals. Okay. We can use also music, for example, yeah. rhythm. And that is very important. The other yeah. thing is there are some individuals that can sing words before they speak them. Yeah. Singing is on different brain circuits. So they can sing the words rather than speak them. And Sometimes that works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grandin, for uh, wonderfully sharing your insights as uh, an autistic person. 
One thing that uh, has caught my arm is that uh, your parents, your mother played a very key role in... Uh, absolutely, absolutely. In uh, then another book um, you might find helpful, you a book called The Way I See It, that's um, I got a lot of little short um, articles in it, uh, it's available on Amazon, um, that might be helpful. Thank um, you. Yeah, they also have a lot of information on the website, templebrandon.com. There's templebrandon.com. There's lots of free information on that. Thank you. So um, I'm a mother of um, triplet boys with autism. They are 11 years old, all different. Uh, they are all on a different spectrum. And uh, one is still nonverbal. And uh, my, all my sons are really not... Um, academically um, gifted. And there's one thing you have mentioned that you're really fortunate and happy that you have a wonderful career. Now, I would like to request if you can share, you know, one word or a direction to us parents. Often we find that we want to follow the typical growth, you know, go to kindergarten, go to primary, go to high school, go to university get a job, get married, all that. But our children, most of our children with autism don't really f seem to fit there. What can you tell well, us? Well, the thing, you have uneven skills. I'm a, I'm a big believer in getting children exposed to lots of different things. Um, I did all kinds of things when I was a child. Cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, music. Um, I was uh, taught musical instruments, and I was terrible at musical instruments, but good at art and mechanical things. And so you expose kids to lots of different things, then you can see what they are good at. But I know, uh, like you look at this equipment here, I've worked with people where a single welding class led to building things like what's shown in that picture. And then another kid, it might be mathematics and programming. Something you have to expose them. And then you've got people with autism that are not going to be building equipment, they're not going to be doing mathematics and programming. Um, let's say you have a kid that's good with numbers. Well, then show him, show him all the mathematical stuff. Here's some really cool pattern stuff right here. I've been on one of my science magazines with those patterns. They all have mathematics behind them. Isn't that cool? <laughs> In a science magazine. Yeah, you know, there's some kids that are going to just, um, uh, they may be gifted in that. You see, this is the problem. You know, they're really good at one thing, sometimes really bad at something else. And the people that build the equipment, like you see there, complicated stuff, most of them could not do algebra. It's all pure visual thinking. But they're building you. stuff like that. Thank you. I, um, I had a chance to go on a corporate jet the other day. Um, the guy that took one welding class, he builds entire beef plants, and there, he just has them memorized in his head. A single welding class. He's building entire beef plants. Um, unfortunately, now, we're he's running. Not, he's not autistic. He's not autistic. Hmm. But I did work with several other people uh, in metalworking that I'm pretty sure were autistic. We're out of time now, so we're just going to have one more question. So I know that we would. One more, one more question. Hello? Midnight or whatever, I'm going to go to bed. But I'm really glad that I could get up and talk to everybody. Yeah, it's a and I'm uh, free to give the videotape around to people. There's more slides in this deck. I uh, can go ahead and give people the whole slide deck. Uh, it was the time for tonight to show all the slides. Uh, hello, Dr. Grandin. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is, right now I'm working as a general practitioner, but when I was a teenager, I had a distant cousin who, at that time, uh, he was seven years old. He has symptoms of um, aggressive behavior and at times, but uh, most of the times he's a very quiet kid. He won't interact yeah. much and everything, but the aggressive behavior is the key point, like it's almost disruptive. And uh, later on, we diagnosed he has autism. But uh, how, old, how old was he when he was doing the destructive behavior? Uh, at seven years old. And uh, because of that, his whole family also have a history of mental illness, like other mental illness. It's uh, stigmatizing. It's so traumatizing for 
all of them especially the boy so how to like uh, deal with aggress autism children with aggressive well, I, behavior I aggressive behavior. The other thing you have to look at, what is bringing it on? Is there a problem with frustration with communication or with sensory overload? Uh, or communication. A, we've got to make sure he doesn't have a pain. If, if the child is not speaking, then you always have to make sure you do not have a hidden painful medical issue, like maybe an ear infection, urinary tract infection, acid reflux in their stomach, a toothache something that's hurting that they cannot tell you about. I think that he had meningitis. He had meningitis. Um, I also have problems with things like getting aggressive when I was a child. It was worse when I got tired. I I had a pretty good sense of when she needed to just say I need to go to my room and like just calm down. Um, but for when I was seven, um, you know, I was fully verbal and there were consequences for aggression. No TV for one night. And then I threw a big tantrum. Mother would put me in my room and let me calm down for half an hour. And then she'd say, well, you know the rule. You can join the family now. But I'm, there'll be no television tonight. You know, and I understood consequences. But I think there's some individuals where they may not make the connection between the tantrum they had in school and no uh, television that night. I, see, this is the problem with autism. You've got such a big range. Um, okay, I think that um, that was true. And then you've got the autistic. You see, the people that I worked with that had the metal working shop and all the patents, designing equipment, they would have been more the Asperger type. There would have been no speech delay. You see, this is where that, and that Asperger type with no speech delay now has been merged in with the autism with speech delay. I had speech delays, so I was definitely not the Asperger type. And the people that I, that I worked with professionally in metal working work would have been the Asperger type. But they had social issues. I'll never forget one of the jobs. Um, I had to drag the guy out of the shop because before he got my papers for plant engineer. <laughs> Um, we're out of time now. Thank you very much. Thank, th thank, thank you, you for joining us. Thank you. And it's my honor to introduce Dr. Alec Sharma. Dr. Alex Sharma is the professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery at LTM Medical College and Hospital in Mumbai, India. He is also the director of NeuroGen Brain and Spine Institute and KLS Institute of Anti-Aging, both in Navi, Mumbai. He is the president of the Stem Cell Society in India and vice president of the International Association of Neurorestoratology he has published 172 scientific papers, authored 24 books, contributed chapters in 19 textbooks, and made over 200 scientific presentations. He is a world-renowned pioneer in the field of cellular therapy for neurological disorders, having treated more than 12,000 patients from 75 different countries. His landmark accomplishments include the publication of the world's first scientific paper on the role of cellular therapy in autism. He has revolutionized the management of neurodevelopmental disorders with his innovative combination of cellular and integrative therapies. For this, he has received several international and national awards, such as the Rose of Parsilisus Award from the EMA Oxford 200. 2016, the European Award for Best Practices, Brussels 2018, the Bharat Gaurav Award, London 2019, the Newton Universal Legendary Award, Boston 2022, the Sinophil Asia International Peace Award, Manila 2023, etc. Let's welcome Dr. Alak Sharma.
this is truly amazing to be in Dubai, to be at this wonderful international conference for autism and neurodevelopmental disorders, but most important to be able to give a talk immediately after Temple Grandin. What an honor. <laughs> I had never thought in my life that you know, one day I'd be speaking after the legendary Temple Grandin. Temple, you're just so amazing. You're not you, your life, your thoughts, your work, your effort. It's not just an inspiration to people on the spectrum, to their families, but to all of us caretakers, researchers, and doctors in the field as well. Uh, so I'd like to begin by thank thanking Temple for the wonderful and amazing talk that she just gave. Uh, I'm going to speak on a new topic that's regenerative medicine in autism spectrum disorders. When I give a talk, I like to begin with this picture. This is a picture, this is a painting, a huge painting, the size of this entire wall, which I found in a hospital in Haolein, Taiwan. And when I, when I entered that hospital, I asked them, why is this picture here? They said, this is a picture of Lord Buddha going into the jungle to heal. And they said the job of the physician is to reach out to people who are in suffering and heal them. So that's what we have to do, reach out and help those in need of healing. Now, if you look at the increasing prevalence of autism, it is actually unbelievable and incredible that the world has not taken notice of what's happening. You look and see in 2004, the incidence was one in 166. In 2023, it has become one in 36. At this rate, in the next two decades, every third child will be, ha will be on the autism spectrum. Okay, this is something we as medical professionals need to bring to the attention of society, of people, of governments, of administrators and rulers, that this is unprecedented. And that the facilities to take care of these children do not match up to the increasing incidence. There are about 70 million kids on the planet. That's 1% of the world's population. It's like a huge, a huge, huge percentage of people. So the current situation is that, you know, you have a child who has some symptoms, you know, the parents notice, you, you go to the doctor, therapist, get a diagnosis, and they say what you can do is therapy, you start the therapy and you're back to where you were. So what's new? What am I going to be talking in this talk that's different? First, the concept of neurodiversity. And this is what Temple spoke of, okay? That we have to see how people on the spectrum are diverse, that they are not less than, they are different, that they have uneven talents and skills. So the concept of neurodiversity, because now there are going to be so many people on the planet that you can't look at them uh, in, in the way that we've been looking at them earlier. The other exciting thing, and I'm going to highlight that, is a better understanding of what's happening with the brain. And this is what has changed everything. Then the whole concept of neuronal regeneration, that it is possible to regenerate the brain that's not functioning as well. And the concept of multidisciplinary management, and of course, the main uh, base of my talk, which is cellular therapy. Now, what is new is that for the first time in medical history, we are now understanding which parts of the brain are functioning differently from neurotypical brains. And we have done scans, we've done a lot of research in this area, and you can see that list, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the parahippocampal gyrus, the cerebellum, the caudate nucleus, the mesial temporal lobes, thalamus, superior and middle temporal poles. So we've actually identified very clearly which parts of the brain are functioning less. We've also identified which parts of the brain are functioning more. Our focus so far has been on what these children can't do. What we also need to look at, which parts of their brain actually are functioning more than what neurotypical people do. And there are actually parts in the calcarine fissure, the Heschel's gyrus, cortical frontal areas that function more. They are hypermetabolic. So we need to understand this as well. And our work has been published in a landmark paper, among the first of it, it's in published literature in the World Journal of Nuclear Medicine, where we've clearly highlighted which parts of the brain work less and which are working more. Now, what we found here, and this is the only thing that we need to give attention to, because Temple again keeps talking of early intervention. 
she keeps talking about early intervention and i'm going to show you the scientific base of the need for early intervention and that is this if you look at this graphic you you will see that uh, you know you will see that the brain metabolism over the years keeps on declining so what you see light green is how the brains of neurotypical kids the brain metabolism keeps on increasing whereas children on the spectrum is the light blue you can see it keeps on declining what does this mean it means the earlier we treat the children the early intervention is there the better results because the later you treat them the hypermetabolism is actually increased so the old thinking was that once the brain is damaged you cannot regenerate it and the new thinking is it's possible to regenerate the brain through cellular replacement and repair the other thing that has changed in autism is the concept of multidisciplinary management you know so far what would happen is a person specializes in something and then that's all they would offer so if you're if you do you know you're a center that has occupational therapy you focus on occupational therapy you have a center that does speech therapy you focus on that but what is the need is a multidisciplinary management which includes everything all the things listed and cell therapy which i will talk about is one of them so there is no one silver bullet the management of autism will be multidisciplinary so look at that on the left hand side you see a fractured bone and i ask yourself will you give rehabilitation to a person with that fractured bone would anybody give physiotherapy on a broken bone now look at the left you go to an orthopedic surgeon you get it fixed don't you and now you give rehabilitation but in autism we do exactly the opposite on the left hand side the blue area is the hypermetabolic brain we are giving rehabilitation on a brain that's not functioning optimally and then we are expecting results of a normal brain it won't happen but through cellular therapy you can see on the right hand side the brain has started functioning again now if you give rehabilitation you are bound to get better results so cell therapy is a promising new modality where you use healthy cells to replace damaged cells so that's the damage and you can see that there is recovery so now look and see what are stem cells so the word stem comes from the stem of a plant and just like from the stem of a plant you can have leaves fruits uh, everything else there are some cells from which all the other cells arise so the way stem cells work is they multiply they convert into other cell types they improve the blood supply and they release certain positive growth chemicals and because of that they repair they regenerate and they replace damaged tissue cells are of two types you can be autologous when you take from the patient put it back in the patient or donor cells when you take it from somebody else there are different types of cells you can get them from the embryo but this is very controversial so we do not use it you can get them from the umbilical cord you can get it from the patient itself from the bone and that's what we use they are called adult stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells are in the research stage so we work with adult stem cells because they are safe they they don't form tumors they have no rejection they are easily obtainable and there are no ethical issues there are different ways of injecting stem cells you can inject it intrathecally into the spinal fluid that's what we do or intravenously intramuscularly through the nose or directly into the brain how does cellular therapy work we know the main problem in autism is there is hypoperfusion decreased oxygenation and problems with the immune system and inflammation cell therapy works through both these mechanisms so here is a small video showing the three basic steps what we do we do a bone marrow aspiration with a needle separate the cells and inject it back the whole process has only two needle pricks let's look at a video there you can see with the needle we are aspirating bone marrow that takes 15 20 minutes the bone marrow is put into machines uh, it separates the cells and once the cells are ready with a very thin needle we inject it back just two needle pricks and we take cells from the child and put it back into the child so let's review what the world literature says so there are a total of 33 clinical studies published papers which show a 80% success rate 33 worldwide papers and if you see a review of literature the world's first scientific paper was published from india it was by us we also published the sixth one the others came from china italy uh, america etc so this is the world's first paper on cell therapy in autism which we published in 2014 Uh, this was our paper and it showed uh, 91% of the patients improved the second paper came from china here again they showed an 88% improvement the third paper came from the united states by dawson 
again showing 90% improvement. This another paper from the United States by Kimberly et al. showing 90% success rate. This paper by Martinez from Mexico showing a 95% success rate. This paper from Vietnam by Tang et al. which showed a 93% success rate. This paper from Italy which showed a 78% success rate. Now this is a meta-analysis. This is a review of 460 patients and at the end in this paper they summarize that cellular therapy is safe and that it improves patients with autism spectrum regardless of what type of cell we use. In this other systemic review by uh, Jing Yang Q from China, they looked at 325 patients and again they said it is safe and effective. So there is enough published worldwide literature to show the effectiveness of cellular therapy. Now this is our latest paper. We had two papers, but I'll, I'll talk about the second paper because this was 254 patients. We use autologous bone marrow mononuclear cells. You can see the improvement in the various symptoms and almost all the symptoms, <coughs> whether it's social interaction, <coughs> eye contact, attention, stereotypical behavior, aggressiveness, hyperactivity, self-injurious behavior, um, sitting tolerance, command following, speech, communication, all these you can see above is the percentage of, of improvement. And we have scales called ISA and CARS and you can see that there was a significant improvement, 94% and 95% in these scales. Now here's something interesting. The results depended on age. So those kids who are less than five years, we had a 97% success rate. Between 5 to 10, it reduced to 94. Between 10 to 15, 94 again. And 15 and above, it was 91. So the earlier we intervene, the better results we are likely to get. Here again, you can see on SCARS scale, again, 98, 95, 90, 91. So you can see that age affects the outcome. Now, what was the objective proof? Because one is clinical improvement. So uh, in our study, we actually showed objective improvement. So above, this is a PET CT scan where the blue areas are the hypometabolic areas, the areas that are functioning less than normal. So you can see above all the blue. Now this is done on a Siemens machine. Below, you see six months later, and you can see the hypometabolic areas are gone. So this is objective proof. I'm just showing you one or two scans, but we have almost 3,000 such scans before and after that show that the brain damage, the parts of the brain that are not functioning appropriately in autism, they can be repaired. And this is proof of that. So this is on a Siemens machine and <coughs> this is on a GE machine. Again, you can see the cerebellum, blue area, hypometabolic, and below you can see that it has improved. So on two different sets of machines, Siemens machine and General Electric machines both show before and after improvement. We have a total of six scientific publications in the results of cell therapy in autism. And now international books, medical books are introducing chapters. So in this book on recent advances in autism, there is a chapter, stem cell therapy in autism spectrum disorders, and they've asked us to write the chapter. So we've written the chapter for this book. Now this is data, this, the, what I showed you earlier was published. This, this, this data of 1,000 patients has been sent for publication. But just to give you uh, an outcome, this is 1,010 patients. And again, you can see more or less similar symptomatic improvements. Again, the ISA and CAR scales, good improvement, uh, individual domains of ISA, and uh, age-wise. Again, you can see the same thing. Below five years, 89% improvement. Uh, above 15 years, it dropped to 80%. And this is the analysis. You can see above the blue areas, the damaged areas. And below, after cell therapy, you can see that the brain has got activated. You can again see above and below. So complications. So we've had no major complications. There has been no neurological deterioration, no infection. However, one major concern is that 3% of our patients uh, develop increased incidence of epilepsy when they already had epilepsy in the past. 10% of the patients get a spinal headache which lasts for one or two days immediately after the procedure and there was some nausea, vomiting, local pain, etc. Now we've published this as a separate paper. People normally like to hide their adverse events. We've published a paper saying that seizures may happen as an adverse event because there is no treatment which does not have adverse events. But if you know it, you can actually manage it. So we've published this as well. 
Uh, now I'll just show you a couple of videos. Just uh, if you have little time, so yeah, we have some time. So I'll show you a couple of videos. There are three patients, three sets of patients from three continents. Uh, this is a child from America. <laughs> Father was a cardiologist, mother is a nurse, and he's improved so much. Today, this kid is not only completely off the spectrum, this, this video is a little old, but he's stopping in school and he's doing wonderfully well. I couldn't get him to engage with me. I couldn't give, get him to give me eye contact over time. He started to lose a lot of vocabulary. Right around 18 months to the age of two years, he just slid backwards. He would flap like that, and he would walk on his tiptoes, look at the wall and be talking to the wall. He had problems with eye contact. He'd never look you straight in the eye. He had problems with his speed. Some research and found out about Neurogen. And the big question that I had in my own mind was, what is there to lose? And I could not come up with a good answer. And I said, we have to do it. started seeing better eye contact, definitely a difference in his engagement with us, with his sibling, his mood, he was so much calmer. Now he's all about taking his own shower. I have to just prompt him to get out, but he'll wash himself and he'll put his clothes on. It's all the PET scan images. We just, I can't tell you the word, we were just so, excited and thrilled. The areas that were hypoactive or non-active were warm. They were, there was, there was activity there. Ganesh has gone from the third grade, fourth month reading level to a seventh grade, first month reading level in five months. And now we have, we have Mercy over here. We went to different doctors, we went to different hospitals, and when I brought it up, they were like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. It's because they are boys, they are triplets, they were premature. I would be walking out and I'm like, bye. And no child is crying, no child is waving back bye. And by then, for sure, I knew that they should be doing that. The children had this behavior of disappearing. In fact, Eric disappeared three times in the middle of the night. The biting, the spitting, the scratching. How are we going to stop this behavior? We went to see the neurologist, and in five minutes, he said, his children are autistic. As parents, it was very traumatizing. First of all, we didn't understand what autistic means. So I decided to really get to read a lot about autism. I remember the first time I read about stem cell. I was like, wow, this is really good. We had a lot of questions which we asked and we got very clear answers from Dr. Sharma. The day of the stem cell itself came Actually, I was a bit anxious, of course, but really I didn't have fear. A bit of apprehension, anxiety, of course, as a mother, but I knew they are in good hands. We put a needle in this pelvic bone, and then we take out the bone marrow, which is the fluid inside the bone. The pure stem cells, once they are ready, a thin needle is inserted into the lower back. We inject the stem cells into the cerebrospinal fluid. It flows all the way up to the brain. Things that would have taken probably years to be accomplished in my sons, in like eight months time, we've really been able to come very far. Just with water. They used to defecate on their clothes, but now they can use the toilet. We've seen a lot of improvement in terms of spitting. The tantrums have reduced. Sleeping used to be a problem before, but at the moment he is taken to his bed, it takes a few minutes and he is asleep. You see my son's cycle. You try to make them understand what it is to pedal, and they couldn't. 
But after stem cell, when we arrived in Kenya the following day, and we went out, and these guys could cycle. I'm going to send you to buy tomato paste, okay? I'm going to send you to buy what? Tomato paste. In the shop. Where is the shop? It's here. Okay. So I'm going to give you money. For what? For buy tomato lollipop. I'm going to wear my shoes. That's right. Parents ask me, so do you really think stem cell works? And I'm like... No! I can see changes. I can touch. I can feel. I can smell. Of course, for me, stem cell works. I'll do it until my children get well. So that's two stories, and uh, by the way, Ricky's right here. You're gonna see him, he's right here. Uh, we are short of time, so I won't talk much about cerebral palsy, but this is a paper, it works just as well in cerebral palsy. We've got 15 articles, chapters, and textbooks, and uh, that's the brain damage before in cerebral palsy, that's after, you can see the improvement. Uh, then in intellectual disability, it works as well. We have the world's first scientific paper. We've treated more than 12,000 patients from 75 countries, total of 106 papers and 16 books. And uh, I'd just like to share the views of our Honorable Prime Minister. I went to Japan. So in Japan, I had one of my work. I got a Nobel laureate scientist there. I got it. That's why I did it. Because they have stem cell research in stem cells. I had to study it, so I had to come to my mind, maybe. इनकी एक खोज हमारे काम आ सकती है क्या है? हम गए तो वहाँ गए, उनसे चर्चा की और बेंगलुरु के हमारे साइंस इंस्टीट्यूट के साथ आज उस दिशा में हमारा काम हो रहा है कि स्टेम सेंस के द्वारा हमारे युवा साइंटिस्ट कुछ खोज करें। So that is the Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, talking in Parliament about stem cells, and here is the President of the United States. Today, with the executive order I am about to sign. We will bring the change that so many scientists and researchers, doctors and innovators, patients and loved ones have hoped for and fought for these past eight years. We will lift the ban on federal funding for promising embryonic stem cell research. <laughs> scientists believe these tiny cells may have the potential to help us understand and possibly cure some of our most devastating diseases and conditions to regenerate the severed spinal cord and lift someone from a wheelchair, to spur insulin production and spare a child from a lifetime of needles, to treat Parkinson's cancer, heart disease, and others that affect millions of Americans and the people who love them. There's no finish line in the work of science. The race is always with us. The urgent work of giving substance to hope and answering those many bedside prayers, of seeking a day when words like terminal and incurable are potentially retired from our vocabulary. So my conclusion is that adult stem cell therapy that we use may be considered a safe and effective treatment option for autism, cerebral palsy, and intellectual disability. It accelerates development, reduces disability, helps in functional recovery, and improves the quality of his life. We heard the, prime, the two biggest democracies in the world are India and America. You heard the Prime Minister of India speak of stem cells, you heard the President of America speak about stem cells. But now I want you to hear somebody more important than that. The child you saw in that video, he's right here, Ricky. Ricky, say a few words. <laughs> Talk to the audience. Thank you, thank you. Say something. Thank you, everyone. I, I like to say 
Thank you for thank you for giving me that neurogen stuff which we made. <laughs> this child could not speak. This child could not go to school. Today he's standing in front of you yeah. and giving a speech. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, come. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. It is really my privilege to introduce this next speaker. When Dali told me that I was going to be introducing him, I said, are you sure you want me to introduce him? Well, I'm here, so I guess she was sure. <laughs> Dr. Carrie Magrove is an award-winning autistic professional speaker, best-selling author, autism consultant to the HBO series Mrs. Fletcher that aired in the fall of 2019 and the latest seasons of Netflix's Emmy Award winning series Love on the Spectrum. If you haven't seen that, you really need to watch it. It is very, very good. He started professional, professionally speaking 12 years ago via the National Speakers Association after he fell in love with theater as a child to help with his social and communication skills. Today he has spoken at over 1,200 events during the time, including two TED Talks and talks at Google presentations. In addition, Kerry is CEO and president of KFM Making a Difference, a nonprofit organization that hosts, hosts inclusion events and has provided 100 scholarships for students with autism for college and counting since 2011. In his spare time, which I'm not sure how he has, he hosts a Facebook page called Carrie's Autism Journey that now has 218,000 Facebook followers where he does on-camera interviews highlighting people impacted by a diagnosis to break down barriers in our community. His videos have, produced, have been produced and have been watched over 35 million times. Carrie's best-selling books, Defining Autism from the Heart, and Autism and Falling in Love, I Will Light It Up Blue, and his latest, Autistics on Autism, have reached the Amazon bestseller list for special needs parenting. Kerry regularly speaks with schools, companies, government organizations, and is always open to discussing potential future collaborations. He is based in Hoboken, New Jersey. Let's give him a really big applause. He's got a video that's supposed to be starting. Not bad for a guy who was completely nonverbal for the first few years of his life. But once Kerry Magro found his voice, he had a lot to say. My parents have always told me I'm special, so why am I special? And then later on, I realized that I'm even more special because I have autism. Carrie Magro's childhood was marked with rough patches. He was completely nonverbal at age two and diagnosed with autism at age four. I just remember um, having difficulties trying to explain myself to the world around me. When Carrie did speak, he struggled to express himself. Most of my memories were simply just about that kid who wanted to communicate with the world around him, but didn't have the verbal means of actually doing that. His mother, Suzanne, remembers watching her son have a hard time adjusting to the outside world. He turned two and he was scared of everything. He was scared of the water, he was scared of the rain. But as the years went on, Carrie slowly began to find his words. When you can't communicate with the people you love the most in this world about even some of your basic needs, it gets really, really tough. So, but luckily, <laughs> once I started talking, <laughs> I never stopped talking. Wow, this is a tough one today. Cindy Shu introduces us to an autistic man who's spreading awareness and understanding throughout the world. And his latest way of educating people about autism is by making TikTok videos. I 
I've received over 4.1 million views on TikTok, and I just had so many parents, educators, family members who just wanted to learn more about autism, and they were like, keep going, keep doing what you're doing because it's making a difference. In college, he started a nonprofit called KFM Making a Difference, which awards autistic students with college scholarships. He later earned his doctorate in education. He's now a professional speaker on autism and inclusion. We've gotten inquiries from people from Africa, Canada, the UK, and it, it's just shown me that we're not alone in this community. There are people impacted by autism across the globe. He's written four books. His latest one is called Autistics on Autism. All proceeds will go to a scholarship foundation. You are going to find 100 amazing autistic adults' stories of how they were able to navigate their adolescence and ultimately succeed in their journeys. He says most publicly funded services end for autistic children when they age out of school, so that could be late teens. He's fighting to get resources for autistic adults through legislation and has this message for parents. Never give up on your child. Never give up on getting them the best quality supports so they could live their best quality of lives because, again, it's a spectrum. And it's really about providing those resources across the lifespan because autistic children will grow up to be autistic adults and we need to be ready for them. And he'll keep promoting awareness any way he can. What I'm doing today... Awesome. I, 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 it is such a huge honor to be here with all of you uh, speaking on a really important topic that is facing so many individuals within our community. And honestly, today, with over 70 million people worldwide having some form of autism diagnosis, it's really important that we do our utmost to do a few quick things. The first one is to realize that autism is just one word trying to describe millions of different stories. My dear friend Stuart Duncan has that comment, comment, and when you meet people with autism, it's really important to meet them where they are in their development. Autism is a very, very wide spectrum. The last time we were here in Dubai, ironically enough, was in 2016, and one of the speakers at that conference with me, his name is Dr. Stephen Shore, an internationally known public speaker who himself is autistic, says if you met one autistic person, you've met just that one autistic person. So let's keep the conversation going on meeting each individual where they are in their own development. So some housekeeping notes today. Uh, I'm an avid note taker during all these presentations. So typically I'm the guy sitting in the front row uh, taking a photo of every single slide so I don't miss anything. Uh, so we're gonna be providing you the PowerPoint slide notes from today's presentation. There will be a QR code at the end of today's presentation. You can scan that with your phone and my dad still loves a Razer cell phone, so there will also be a link uh, if you don't have a smartphone as well, so you don't miss any of the notes. So during my journey, uh, I grew up with two laser-focused key interests. I grew up wanting to be uh, the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys, and I also wanted to grow up to be the next Larry Bird. Uh, and with my autism diagnosis, I've always had extreme laser-focused key interests, uh, and those were two of the big ones. Uh, sports helped me with a lot of my fine motor skills growing up with autism. In addition to having autism, I also have a dual diagnosis of dysgraphia. It's really important that when we meet individuals where they are in their own development, that we look for comorbidities. So if an individual might have a dual diagnosis, we are able to diagnose that as early as possible. Early intervention truly, truly is the key within those first five years, getting a diagnosis is really, really pivotal. So I took my love of sports to get a degree in sport management at St. Hall University, uh, where I'm based in New Jersey, uh, before deciding to change career paths. I realized that there, those with individuals with disabilities make up the largest minority in the United States, and often they are one of the most underserved, because simply put, some individuals in our community have strong support needs and might not be able to advocate for themselves. So it's really, really important that we do our utmost to try to help one of the most underserved 
communities in the world today. So I decided to change career paths. I received a uh, master's in strategic communication so I could become one of the first professionally certified speakers who is openly autistic in the United States. It's given me the opportunity to travel the globe in the past 12 years and get the opportunity to speak with so many incredible groups like your own about this topic of autism, but then also diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of our big, big focuses, especially in the past few years, has really been focused on corporate and really focused on helping those with autism find meaningful employment and tapping into one of the most untapped talent pools that employers should consider. So really quickly today, and again, this was a journey, uh, I want you to imagine something really quickly. Imagine not being able to tell your loved ones that you love them. Not being able to speak in full sentences until you were seven years old. Having sensory challenges to the point where you felt like an alien compared to other people. Being such a picky eater <laughs> that any time your parents tried to introduce you to a new food, it made you cringe. This used to be my life. When I was a kid, there were so many people who told me what I would never be able to do in this life. They would also tell me that I would have a photogenic memory, that I would be really, really great at math, and when I turned 21, my parents would take me to Las Vegas with them and I would win them $88,000 on the blackjack tables. <laughs> Prototypically, this was, I was considered a Rain Man diagnosis. I was considered a savant, but I was also considered somebody who had a lot of limitations in his life. So what helped get me to where I am today speaking in front of all of you was uh, over 15 years of occupational speech and physical therapy, there's no one size fits all when it comes to our autism community. One of the first movies I ever got the opportunity to consult on was a movie from Warner Brothers called Joyful Noise, starring Queen Latifah and Dolly Parton based on one of the characters in that film having autism. And Queen Latifah's character has a great quote in that movie where she says, when things don't fit, in a nice, pretty box, you build a bigger box. And that's what we have to do for individuals in their autism community. And my mom, love her to death, she's here with me today, uh, had the opportunity to really create a bigger box for me, and that's why I am uh, here today. I love you, mom. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. And now she's gonna be blushing for the next 30 minutes, so. I am so sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, but she found what worked for me. She found that occupational speech and physical were integral, uh, using my key interest of being the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys to find music and theater therapy as an integral way of helping me with my sensory processing challenges. Also including reward systems and token systems as a way of helping me build on my self-motivation, especially when I was initially diagnosed with uh, autism when I was four years old, and then also positive reinforcement practices. Telling our kids what they are good at at the beginning of each day can really help provide a positive mindset for them in their academics every single day, but also their lives as well. And then also self-advocacy. It's so important in our society that we teach our kids about their diagnoses at earlier ages, because I grew up knowing I was special, but not knowing what that meant. So for years in my life, it was just me going to specialized children's hospitals and finding services and seeing kids lining up blocks uh, and lining up their toys. And I was always like, these individuals are special just like me, but why am I special? And it was so life-changing to learn about my diagnosis. So my background today, uh, I would say about 80% of our annual referrals are in uh, speaking with diversity, equity, inclusion groups, uh, employee resource groups, about tapping into this untapped talent pool. Some of the things that you should know is that those with autism, on average, are more likely to stay at a job longer. They are more likely to take less time off from work. And when we talk about the majority of reasonable accommodations, I speak to so many companies, even globally, who say, well, Carrie, I'm not sure if I could actually hire somebody who's on the autism spectrum because I think it's going to affect the bottom line. And a lot of people don't know this, the, the majority of reasonable accommodations cost absolutely nothing, and when they do, it's typically just an onboarding fee of around $500 to $1,000. So let's start changing the conversation. I took my love of theater uh, when I graduated from college to really just get involved with the entertainment industry. I got to meet a wonderful man named Todd Graff, who uh, was directing this movie called Joyful Noise, 
And I told him about how theater had an impact on me growing up on the autism spectrum. And he was like, Carrie, would you like to be a consultant on this film? I didn't actually know this was a job that people could get paid for. And I thought I was getting punked at the time. Uh, and I thought it was just like a practical joke that my parents kind of like threw at me from like a family friend. Uh, but within just a few days, uh, I was working on this Hollywood film with one of the characters having autism. And we've now got an opportunity to work on a wide range of films and TV shows today that focus on autism related characters because representation truly, truly matters within our community and seeing more individuals with disabilities on the screen today. I took my love of trying to support the disability community to start a 501c3 nonprofit organization called KIF and Making a Difference, where we provide not only peer mentoring for individuals with developmental disabilities from the ages of 16 to 24, but we also have provided 130 scholarships for autistic students to pursue a post-secondary education in the past nine years. And 100% of our, 100%, uh, 100 of our scholarship applicants uh, actually uh, wrote a chapter for our book, Autistics on Autism, where 100% of the proceeds from this book that came out last year go directly back to support our nonprofit organization. So along the way, uh, one of my mentees, when I was just starting off my nonprofit, said to me, Carrie, how do I learn more about the autism community from people who are actually impacted by autism? And I didn't have any resources to share with him, really. So I thought to myself, why not write a book? Uh, I assumed it would sell 50 copies and be a good Christmas gift for my parents. Uh, when my first book, Defining Autism from the Heart, came out, focused on self-advocacy. But within three days, it became an Amazon bestseller for special need parenting. And it continued to give us a platform to discuss autism within our communities, writing books about autism and relationships, college for uh, students with disabilities, in addition to how we look at this life after lockdown, after COVID-19, how we could support individuals with developmental disabilities. And one of the most fun things I get to do as part of my job is I get to meet local self-advocates and I get the opportunity to nurture their, their self-advocacy. Uh, we got to meet this incredible family uh, that I wanted to highlight with all of you today because it's a unique message that I hope more people in our community can really relate to. So we're going to play this video and fingers crossed tech works. Yeah. You have two sisters, Rachel. Both sisters. Both sisters. JJ, what do you like to do for fun? His personality is amazing. He's just, he's so funny. He doesn't even know it. Like, he doesn't know how funny he is, which makes it better. Um, I love how JJ makes his movies, and he uses the stuff that belongs to him, and he gives us to all of us, and that's his favorite thing. What is one of your favorite things about your sister? Mm -hmm. like So one of the key messages I hope I could leave you with today is that it takes a village. And you have to realize that regardless of where you are in this journey, whether you're an educator here today, a therapist, a parent, or a self-advocate, it's important to know 
that every single individual in your lives can hopefully become part of this village to make sure that we're providing reliable autism resources across the lifespan for our over 70 million individuals who are autistic today. So every single place I go to speak, I've had the opportunity to travel the globe and get the opportunity to share my story, but I realized that many individuals in our local communities didn't have an opportunity to share and lift their voices. So I started a video series as part of my Facebook page, Carrie's Autism Journey, where we now get to not only nurture self-advocacy in these young individuals, but also give them a platform to hopefully break down barriers and biases within our community. We've highlighted everyone from a, a six-month-old with Down syndrome in the Bahamas all the way to an Army veteran with cerebral palsy who didn't tell uh, his platoon that he had cerebral palsy so he could fight for our country. So it was truly, truly remarkable. The other big note uh, I hope I could leave you with today is that Girls with disabilities often fall through the cracks in our society. We see this so much with so many girls being able to being able to bear mask, different characteristics such as stimming, such as known as self-stimulatory behavior. There are some individuals who fall through the cracks because of that. We're gonna skip this video and maybe come back for it if we have a little bit of time. But what I will tell you about Rachel's story is that Rachel is a truly amazing individual who didn't get diagnosed until she was a little bit older. And and it was because of, again, some, so much stigma in our communities is focused on boys with disabilities. Now, we're not only talking about autism, but we're talking about ADD, ADHD, and the neurodiverse lens that we talk about in our communities. In addition to that, when we talk about this topic of autism, we need more not only government organizations, but we also need more travel destinations to go about certification. I've had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with a group uh, called IBCCES, who do certified autism centers around the country. We just spent uh, yesterday at Aqua Venture uh, at Atlantis, and they are a certified autism center. We got to see sensory guides that they had uh, for different rides, which told you how much sensory processing each ride specifically had. And it was just so amazing to see the structure there, especially to bring families of autistic children to our parks. It was truly an amazing thing to see. In addition to that, when we talk about uh, this, it's also just great to reduce stigmas. One of the great things about certified autism centers is that they train up to 80% of their employees on autism and sensory awareness in the hopes of helping these individuals understand a little bit more about how to approach our community. Uh, so how I got involved in making the world more inclusive, uh, my interest in cert certif certification started with wanting to host more sensory friendly uh, meetings in my home state of New Jersey. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've played an autism and sensory friendly Santa Claus, uh, where we had the opportunity to meet children with disabilities at their level uh, to really truly support them, especially from a sensory processing perspective. So I decided to join a board called IBCCS based in Jacksonville, Florida in 2019 to support this community. So during my uh, work in public speaking, one of the most interesting experiences I had was when I was speaking at a Fortune 500 company. And we were speaking about diversity, equity, inclusion. And one of the individuals in there asked me if every single person who has autism grows up to be the good doctor. If anyone has seen The Good Doctor, The Good Doctor is a show on ABC focused on Dr. Sean Murphy, a savant who is on the autism spectrum. And that is why we need to make sure people realize that autism is not only in children, but there are going to be individuals in our workplaces that you meet in the future who are also going to have these diagnoses. And not every single person you meet will end up fitting in this lens of the Rain Man Good Doctor stereotype. So that's the other big thing. We have to realize that autism has no look. Typically, the two most common things people say to me when they come up to me for the first time is they say, Carrie, you have autism, but you don't look like you have autism. And then also, Carrie, you have autism, but you look so normal. It, disability has no look. And it's important that we all, not only discuss this, because it's also important about promoting kindness. When we talk about our society, there are going to be people that 
you meet who you're only going to see the challenges that may face on the surface. You're not going to know what's going on in day-to-day -day lives. So one of my biggest challenges, though, was sensory related. Uh, I grew up being having a hypersensitivity when it came to loud noises. I would wear earbuds in my ears. I would wear sunglasses in many of my classrooms due to fluorescent lights. So luckily, though, I had a, a not only a great occupational therapy team, but I also had an in-house occupational therapist who truly, truly helped me. And this is a global movement that we're seeing. There are more groups that want to go about certifications because they, they realize that it's not only the right thing to do, but it also demonstrates high ROI because at the end of the day, more individuals are likely to buy products from groups that patronize with the disability community and support those with disabilities. We were so excited to see that Mesa, Arizona became one of the first autism certified cities in the globe. And they've done a, tr a remarkable gr work, not only to provide certified autism centers for first responder groups, but also their businesses and travel destinations as well. And in addition to that, Dubai uh, recently announced uh, it plans to become the first certified autism destination in the Eastern Hemisphere. Give your guys yourselves a round of applause. That's really, truly, truly remarkable. And we need more individuals like yourselves championing this cause. So we applaud Dubai for taking the necessary steps to make certifications like this possible, realizing the importance of the autism community. Uh, one of my favorite experiences uh, I've ever had uh, was at a certified autism center. I, a after growing up as somebody who struggled with textural issues and having issues with water on my skin, there was always something soothing about uh, playing with animals in the water. So I got to go to the Discovery Cove in Florida, which was at a certified autism center, and we got the opportunity to swim with dolphins. And I have terrible balance issues. I can't ride a bike for the life of me. Uh, and in the water that day, I was having some challenges because the actual, the land was very, very tough. On my, I also had flat feet, so that didn't help the situation. So I, I was at Discovery Cove, and one of the best things that somebody did for me there was just showing me compassion. They not only showed me compassion in being able to just hold my hand while I was going in the water to swim with the dolphins, but they asked questions when they were unsure about something. I think some of the easiest things that can help our autism community are some of the things that just make the most common sense in the world. Continue to ask questions when you're uncertain about something, and then also presuming competence. They presumed competence for me every single minute that I was there at that park. And that's truly why I love the idea of certifications in our local community. In addition to that, other things to consider, autism and the majority of disabilities are life long. While early intervention is the key, those first five years are pivotal, we need to realize that people don't cure themselves of having autism. We spoke at, uh, in uh, Egypt a few years ago when we were laying the pyramids of Giza blue, and I was just talking to somebody about this earlier, and one of the, one of the parents would ask me if exorcisms could cure autism. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective I haven't heard from before. Uh, it just goes to show that the education truly needs to be there in more of our local communities. Because if you don't have that personal connection, and just by a show of hands really quickly today, how many of you uh, know of somebody who's on the autism spectrum? And if you feel comfortable, how many of you have a sibling or a family member who's on the autism spectrum? Okay. And if you feel comfortable enough, how many self-advocates are here today? Yeah, we have quite a few. It takes a village, and using your voice can truly make such an important, important change within our community. Another key message I hope I can leave you with today, if it isn't written down, it didn't not happen. Documentation is so, so important, especially when we look in 2023. Hearsay is something we really can't get behind anymore. We need to make sure that we're not only documenting in our workplaces, but also for our kids. I think it's important for every therapist and educator to have a journal where they can document for their child, look at short and long-term goals that they have for the individuals, and but also helping the parents understand about their developmental milestones as well. And I truly believe this message right here. I think schools should truly have a mandatory class 
that you get credit for, where you learn more about people with diagnoses. Imagine students getting just a little education on autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, dyslexia, cerebral palsy. It can make a huge impact on understanding and acceptance. I truly believe that in that message. And that's why many individuals in our local communities are pivoting our conversations. April is also known to many of us as Autism Awareness Month. But many individuals in our community are pivoting it to Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, realizing that it's not enough to just be aware about autism, but how can we be inclusive? So these are some great ways that we can be inclusive in our education setting today. One of the biggest things I say is that finding an individual and understanding what type of learner they are, whether they're a visual learner, whether they're an auditory learner, or whether they're a kinetic learner, where they learn by movement and moving around. Being able to, again, meet every single individual where they are. Being concise, giving choices, also considering visual timers as a way of helping individuals with transitions. Educate on stimming and flapping. For example, I've been stimming this entire time. Every single time I've moved my hand like this, this is a stem. And for everyone here in this room, every single one of you stem. Whenever you've rocked back and forth in a chair during a long meeting, that's a stem. Stimming and flapping can look vastly different. Some are going to be arm movements, twirling around in circles, while some of it is just like me, just rubbing my hands and doing this every now and then. And for so many individuals, if you see that happening, don't stop the stim, especially if it's not injurious to them or people in their local community. Uh, also, in addition to that, in our school systems, we really need to focus on the parent-teacher collaboration. But in addition to that, we also need to realize that mental health is a true, true priority. We need to defeat stigmas that see autism as a mental health disorder, but we do need to realize that some people with autism have mental health-related challenges and comorbidities. So connecting on people on a personal level, but also researching social emotional learning as well can be really beneficial. Also, in addition to that, consider lesson plans in your schools focused on giving individuals positive peer role models to look up to. We get the opportunity to speak in a wide range of K through 12 schools where we get the opportunity to discuss, for example, individuals like Michael Jordan has ADD, Magic Johnson has attention deficit disorder, and my favorite on this list, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, Dan Aykroyd grew up with two laser-focused key interests. He grew up wanting to be uh, a ghost hunter, and he grew up wanting to become a crime detective, and he took those two key passions to co-write a movie in the 1980s called, does anyone know what the movie is? Okay, sorry, karaoke with us later. We'll be outside during the lunch break. Uh, but it's so true. And years later, he would sit down with a reporter and he would say that it was because of his autism diagnosis was the reason that he was able to come out with that script. So when we look at some people with disabilities, realize that some people with disabilities are truly capable of amazing things. In addition to that, it's important to rule out as many associated and mental health conditions as humanly possible as well. And that was something my parents did for me. Uh, learning about my diagnosis, I didn't learn about my diagnosis until I was in a social skills class where we were playing disability celebrity bingo, where we were learning about all these individuals. And I raised my hand and I asked the teacher, so teacher, you said all these people, some of the most talented and successful people in the globe are special, just like me. So why am I special? And she said I had to talk to my parents about that. So I talked to my parents about it right after school that day, and that was the first time they ever told me that I had autism. And it was life-changing. For so many years of not knowing why I was special, everything came full circle for the first time. And I started understanding why I, did, I was stimming, why I was wearing sunglasses in many of my classrooms, and everything just came to perfect sense for me. So it's important when we talk about this to have earlier conversations so when our children are in school, they can understand a little bit more about the accommodations that they may receive. Also consider having a dialogue with parents that you may know about the importance of a child's diagnosis as well. So in addition to that, what helped me is we need to emphasize that the key is communication, not speech. There's gonna be individuals in our community, 
specifically where I'm based in the United States, 40% of all autistic people are either non-speaking or non-verbal. But one of the stigmas we have is that a lot of people think that they are unintelligent and have a low IQ. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Most people on average, especially in the United States who are nonverbal, have an average to above average IQ. So we need to realize that also the key is communication, not speech. But just because somebody is nonverbal does not necessarily mean that they're unintelligent. There's some great global tools that you can use to understand how individuals in your communities communicate, such as the communication matrix. Uh, this is a free benchmarking tool that helps assess how individuals communicate within our local communities from things like pre-attentional behavior, intentional behavior, and then also unconventional, and also helping you understand the differences between nonverbal and non-speaking because there's a lot of stigmas around that. Nonverbal literally means no noises at all, no babbling at a certain amount of months a kid is growing up. Non-speaking could be something completely opposite of that. In addition to that importance of peer mentoring, uh, I truly believe that every school system in our, around the globe should have a strong peer mentoring program because it just makes sense. It doesn't affect the bottom line in our schools. Typically, it just takes an academic advisor 20 to 25 hours every academic year to put into place to give kids positive peer role models. And not only has been shown to lead to decreases in depression, anxiety, but it also helps from a bullying prevention perspective as well. Uh, and then social connections can lead to academic success. We need to educate our schools about the importance of providing more elective opportunities, but also more unified uh, classrooms as well, helping individuals with and without disabilities be able to interact, not only to become more inclusive overall, but to help them have those social connections because a little awareness can truly go a long way. Uh, and then also considering educating uh, around universal design for learning. Uh, lecture style is truly, truly dying in many of our communities. So the importance of getting individuals out of their seat and engaging with them is really, really important. Hey, Mama Max, how am I doing on time? Uh, Nice, nice. See, I put her to work. I put her to work, guys. Uh, encouraging uh, parent involvement can also be, and she'll be blushing for the next 12 minutes, too. It's amazing. I love you. I love you, Bob. I love you. Uh, encouraging parent involvement uh, is really uh, key as well. Uh, I did my dissertation. I got my doctorate in education at New Jersey State University, so I could become an adjunct professor while I continue my full-time job uh, public speaking. And I did a qualitative study focused on the perception of resources for parents of children with autism who are in online communities. And what we learned from these semi-structured interviews was the importance of trying to find a village, especially for those who have multiple jobs, for military families who might be traveling a lot, being able to find your village online. And seeing that a lot of parents have found success using Facebook groups and other methods of technology as a way of helping them communicate, especially around referrals towards different therapies and supports in their local areas. Also consider in your schools having alumni organizations comprising of individuals with disabilities to educate the school districts about the disability community and what helped them when they were in school. Again, something that doesn't affect the bottom line and it just makes a lot of sense. In addition to that, creating home safety zones, one of the things that we've loved about the certified autism centers we've seen here in Dubai is that each one of them has a quiet zone or a quiet space. And that just helps so many of us, regardless if somebody has autism and has social and communication challenges or sensory related challenges. All of us could use a quiet space every now and then. I know I could. Uh, and then also, uh, considering how we look at visuals, especially for non-speaking individuals, I definitely recommend, especially in local parks that you know, considering advocating with your local governments to look at instituting communication boards as a way of helping individuals who are non-speaking communicate with those who are verbal. Uh, PEX boards, also known as picture exchange communication systems, are something that has truly been uh, very, very helpful for many individuals within our autism community. In addition to that, we need more inclusive events in our classrooms. And I wanted to share a quick video with all of you so you could get a little sense of one of the things that we're doing to try to be more inclusive for the world. Sarah Callagy had a one-of-a-kind meeting with Santa. The eight-year-old has autism and is nonverbal. Her father brought her 
to this event because this is Santa's helper understand the challenges of autism firsthand. Santa also has autism. <laughs> Such a special connection, special bond. The helper is actually 28-year-old Carrie Madro. Diagnosed at four, his sensory challenges prevented him from visiting Santa as a child. He created this event so others like him don't miss out. This event is more inclusive because we dim the lights. We, we turn down the sound and try to help them as much as we can. Just to reach out. It just takes his time. There's no rush. Most of the elves and Mrs. Claus are occupational therapists and special education teachers. The team visited with 181 special needs families, including four-year-old Rusty Marsh. Is this the first time you've seen Santa? Yes. Is it? Yes. And was he a nice Santa? Yes. With one in 68 children diagnosed with autism, Madrum hopes to inspire more sensory-friendly events all year round. Autism doesn't stop in December. It doesn't stop during Christmas. I want everyone to be happy. Santa says, This is the best Christmas gift of all. This is the third year of the event, and Magma's mom is one of those jolly elves. So uh, the girl in the last uh, slide that said, I, I want everybody to be happy, we're actually working on a children's book together right now that uh, it's going to be focused on uh, autism and sensory friendly Santa, where uh, I believe most of the proceeds will go back to our, our scholarship uh, program as well. So it's just important overall when we talk about these sensory friendly inclu inclusion events. It, again, it just makes sense. It gets more people out to our public areas. It also can help build attendance, especially after COVID-19 with COVID-19 hesitancy in some of our areas. If you want to learn more about how you can create a sensory friendly in inclusive event, I would definitely recommend going to this website called paautism.org. On their website, they have a one sheet PDF where you can learn a little bit more about the sensory considerations you could put into place to make this a reality in your local area, such as being able to to turn down bright lights, turn down external noises, and the other sensory considerations as well. Also realize that bullying is such a huge epidemic uh, across the globe. When we were here in 2016 speaking at the Autism Around the World Conference, we got to work with the Dubai Autism Center. And one of the key messages that we left with them was that bullying is something that's not only in school-aged children, we see a lot of bullying in the workplaces today as well. So we have to realize that this could be a lasting challenge for many in our community. I didn't have the social abilities to defend myself in many cases as somebody who didn't start speaking complete sentences until I was seven. And it's really, really important that we educate our kids on the what a friend is, what a bully is, and how to go about stopping bullying, especially for our verbal students. When stopping bullying like happened for me completely, I realized what bullies did. So I would role play different scenarios in my classrooms with my teachers on how to stop a bullying, where if somebody said to me, Carrie, you have autism, but you're so stupid, I would turn around and I'd be like, well, yeah, um, you know, sometimes I do stupid things. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. And that literally would stop the bully from actually, because when you don't give them the power over you, we have to realize that bullying simply is just that, an imbalance of power. And when somebody want, that bully wants the power over somebody else, being able to tell the bully that regardless of what you say, you could hate my guts, I'm still gonna love you anyway, it completely stops that situation from happening. So let's continue those conversations. October is also National Bullying Prevention Month, so it has a global perspective on discussing the importance of pivoting from autism awareness to autism acceptance. There's also going to be individuals in your community who would prefer to be called an autistic individual versus a person with autism. That's really, really important to understand. There's some individuals, especially in our autism and deaf communities, who find validation uh, in their diagnoses. So in addition to that, when you look at things like low functioning and high functioning, it's really, really important to understand that I could speak in front of a room of 300 people like today and be considered quote unquote high functioning, but people don't see the struggles that 
I'm probably going to have to deal with tomorrow, recharging my batteries because of being able to speak, hearing the speakers and the loud noises going on. And during that time, I would not be considered, quote unquote, high functioning. So when you think about this, consider support needs, those who might have high support needs versus low support needs. And like so many of our speakers have already mentioned, just calling the individual by their name and explaining a little bit more about their strengths and associated challenges. So finally, the 10 things that really helped me get to where I am today speaking in front of all of you. The first thing is that we need to make sure that we're providing positive peer role models, that we're focused on the transition period as well. Our autistic kids will become autistic adults and we need to be ready for them. I've given two TED Talks that are available to check out on YouTube focused on adult autism where we discuss this in more detail. Uh, role playing, it just helps everyone. It helps build a structure, not only in terms of mock interviews, dating scenarios, but also helping build on social skills as well. Uh, servant leadership, I had so much mind blindness growing up and I thought it was my way or the highway most of the time. And I didn't understand the perspectives of others. And getting involved in community service helped open my eyes to some of the hardships that individuals face in their communities. I think that our students should have just 10 hours of community service every academic year to understand more about the perspectives of others in their community. Learning from other self-advocates, you obviously got to hear from Dr. Temple Grandin. She is phenomenal this morning. Uh, but continuing to promote self-advocates to give individuals an opportunity to look up to somebody. Peer mentoring, it just makes sense. Every school should have them. Uh, before COVID-19, we were giving staff development for 350 educators in Las Vegas. And we asked them, how many of you have a strong peer mentoring program in your school? And only three out of the 350 raised their hands. And I was stunned. This doesn't affect the bottom line, and it's just the right thing to do. Uh, like Queen Latifah's character says, create a bigger box. So when it comes to therapy, you have to meet each individual where they are. But I've seen positive benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy as a way of helping individuals go towards positive thoughts who might have negative thoughts and challenging behaviors. Uh, Self-reflection, I think, again, documentation is key for all the educators in the room. But in addition to that, it just helps build on self-awareness for individuals, especially those who are just learning about their diagnosis. Physical activity, as we more, learn more about the brain, we're also real, realizing that just 30 minutes of walking a day has benefits on short-term and long-term retention while also helping with positive endorphins. Also finding support networks, ICANN is a tremendous, tremendous resource. I hope all of you go to their website after this presentation today and really gain the resources, get their ebook because they're truly making a difference. And then also writing a blog because your voice has true, true power within our community. And it's upon all of us. If I could leave you with any final message is I hope you can be brave. I grew up being the kid who never wanted to t tell anybody about my autism diagnosis because I was worried how everybody would feel when they heard that I had autism for the first time. And now today I go into the companies and they say to me, uh, Carrie, I, I want to do professional development on autism and I want to have you speak in my conferences, but I don't, I'm not brave enough to kind of talk about autism because it's such a sensitive topic. And with the numbers continuing to increase, not only where I'm from in the US where it's one in 36, but globally, I want every single one of you in this room to be brave because it's about our community and it's about supporting these individuals across the lifespan. So I like to say that autism can't define me and I define autism and I can only hope that regardless of any single journey that any of you have in this life, that you can go out there, and you can define your lives and your journeys in the way that you best see it every single day. And if you need any help getting started in these conversations, please stay in touch. Thank you all so much for having me here today. Yeah, so just one um, small announcement that we have. We would really love to felicitate uh, Carrie's mother. And we would like to call upon uh, Miss Mercy, as she's as well a parent, and uh, hand over the award to Carrie's mother. Ma'am, please.
Now, it's a true honor to call Dr. Nadia Al Saig on stage. She's our chief guest. Please, all of y'all, a big round of applause for ma'am. She's the founder and director general of Census Residential and Daycare for Special Needs. We would really like to fel felicitate ma'am as Census has been the strategic partner for ICANN. Next, we would... Uh, Social media. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll just do a bit of that. Next, we would like to felicitate MENA organization as well, as they as well are the strategic partners for ICANN. A big round of applause. Thank you so much. And now we would like to fel felicitate Farhan Shahid, who is from Census and uh, has been helping us with the entire organization of ICANN. So thanks to one and all for helping us putting this show up. Okay, now I would like to invite Dr. Nadia to say a few words. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala khair al-anam Muhammad al-Mustafa wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Good morning, everyone, and I would like to welcome the International Conference for Autism and New Developmental Disorder, ICANN Dubai 2023. It's a great honor to be a part of this event and hope we, came, we come down with this conference with the best practice to the region and share knowledge to the latest trends on autism and new, uh, new uh, developmental disorder. And really, I would like to, have, uh, to take the opportunity to thank you all, thank the speakers and the partners of this conference, and especially the audience for your particip participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we will be inaugurating our book, Treatments for Autism. Um, as we did see in the film, it was earlier already inaugurated in English, but now we are inaugurating it in Arabic language. So ma'am would do the honors.
give you a brief about this book. This book has all the therapies, treatments, all the information about autism and all kinds of newer age treatments as well in the book. You can have a copy online on our website. You can request for that as well as we have uh, English books that are available. So you can just send us an email on our website. Just log on to www.autismconnect.com and uh, you can just subscribe for the book and you will be uh, able to get one. Thank you so much everyone. I would really, really, really be very thankful to all of you. Thank you so much.